uh, NAPA website. So good morning, good evening, and namaste to everyone who have joined us today to uh, participate in the Applied Bioinformatics in Agriculture and uh, Medicine seminar. I'm Dave Podil, and I'm a postdoctoral associate at the University of Florida. I'm currently the Joint Secretary of NAPA, and we're really glad to have all of you here today. We had an overwhelming response with more than 400 people registered for this seminar. And we have an excellent lineup of speakers and we hope that you will have a great time in this seminar. Uh, without much delay, I'd like to introduce to you the moderator for today, Dr. Himal Luitil. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Devji. Uh, welcome everybody. Good, uh, good uh, morning in Nepal and good evening in America and uh, uh, maybe good afternoon somewhere else. Uh, uh, I don't know exact location of all the participants. Uh, today, we are very glad to have such kind of uh, applied bioinformatics in agriculture and medicine. This is a really, really uh, very interactive and good uh, um, seminar that will open eyes uh, the um, beginners as well as uh, we academicians. And today, uh, we will have this program like a very brief uh, uh, start of uh, some address from uh, NAPA president and uh, uh, vice chancellor of AFU. And then we will immediately jump into technical session. And uh, uh, I will moderate uh, these uh, sessions. And uh, I would like to request all the participants uh, to um, raise the questions in the ch chat box. I will write and prioritize accordingly. And at the end of the uh, today's session, uh, we will have um, discussion and then the, all the questionnaires uh, will be addressed by the experts. So without uh, delay, I would like to uh, request uh, um, Associate Professor Dr. Isuri Prasad Kaderia, who is the director of Center for Biotechnology at AFU, uh, to welcome everybody in this um, meeting. Okay, thank you, Imal and Dave. Uh, good morning, everybody. Respected Vice Chancellor, AFU, Dean, Faculty of Agriculture, uh, uh, AFU, President of NAPA, and other distinguished intellectuals and all participants from all over the globe. Thank you all for coming and joining here. First of all, I would like to welcome you all in this very special program of such kind and some workshop on applied bioinformatics in agriculture and medicine. This program is all about application of bioinformatics in life science and special attention will be given in genomics with possible hand skill. Center for Biotechnology and NAFA are jointly organizing this program. Facilitators of this program are well-trained, well-experienced, well-experienced, and graduated from renowned universities of US and Europe. We are very proud to be able to organize it today with all of you. Just before getting started, I would like to express my gratitude to all of you who so, so generously helped us to make this event come together smoothly. I must remember Dr. Ananda Acharya, a scientist from Cordova AgriScience US, who is taking lead role for organizing this program and also regular support to air group center providing from last two years by teaching bioinformatics course. Likewise, special thanks also goes to Dr. De Powell, Dr. Sangeet Lamchane, Dr. Radhika Bartola, Dr. Saroj Prajuli, and Sisil Subedi, those who are actively involving for this program from the very beginning. I also would like to express my sincere gratitude to Vice Chancellor of EAFU, Professor Sarada Thapalia, and NAPA President, Professor Megraj Prajuli, for the continuous inspiration and encouragement to organize such kind of program. We have more than 400 registered participants from all over the globe. Your learning attitude and passions are really praiseworthy. I believe during these five days, you will be able to know more about modern tools and techniques of genomics, bioinformatics, and biotechnology. So once again, very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Isari Kaderia. Uh, now I would like to jump on uh, the keynote address uh, from uh, NAPA President, 
Professor Dr. Meghnath Pravili. Okay, let's see how I can go back to the screen share. Okay. Uh, should be this. Okay. My slide should be up now, Dr. Dev. Yeah, it is coming. Yeah. Let me get to slide mode. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Before I begin, I like to repeat some of the things that has been already said. That is the enormous opportunity that we have. You can see on my slide, uh, Association of Nepalese Agricultural Professionals of America was established in 2016, only four years ago. In the last four years, we have really uh, made tremendous pro progress on uh, putting together the coalition of all the agricultural and natural resource professionals uh, residing both inside and outside Nepal. Uh, even though the, the society is called Americas, but uh, we have membership all throughout the world. Uh, I'll show you a few, a few data points uh, down the road on my presentation. Uh, in the last four years, uh, moving from just uh, the thought of putting together a scientific uh, uh, or the professional organization of uh, expat uh, Nepalese agriculturists. Today, we are delivering a joint symposium with one and only uh, agriculture university in Nepal, uh, jointly with Napa, uh, with 400 plus members uh, or the, uh, the students and professionals joining this uh, joint symposium. That in itself is a tremendous uh, progress and example uh, that uh, when we join hands, we can do a lot of things uh, to have the best uh, academics in Nepal. So with that, uh, uh, I, I welcome everyone to this and I will try to be brief because uh, oftentimes we invest a lot of our energy on formalities and uh, sacrifice our uh, time and energy where uh, we should be uh, uh, actually teaching um, and sharing the technical information. So I'll try to be as, as deep as possible. Uh, today, uh, as it has been already mentioned, uh, this is, uh, we, are, we are beginning the AFU Napa Joint Symposium on Applied Bioinformatics in Agriculture and Medicine. Um, my name is uh, Megan Asparajuli. I have other colleagues here uh, from uh, Napa executive uh, uh, team, some current and some uh, former. Uh, I'm currently the president of Napa and Regents Fellow Professor at Texas a &M University. Uh, I had the privilege of serving as a, uh, a junior faculty of uh, entomology uh, in Rampur uh, many moons ago, 30 plus years ago, I think 31 some years ago, I left Rampur and I still have my heart, uh, part of my heart uh, is with Rampur. So this is a tremendous opportunity for me personally to say a few words, to address my colleagues, uh, known and unknown uh, number of uh, students and professionals they are tuning in today on this symposium. It has been already uh, mentioned, but uh, this is a, an honor for me to recognize these hardworking individuals on behalf of Napa uh, today to deliver this five-day uh, joint symposium. Uh, particular thank goes to uh, Dr. Ananta Acharya, who is the, uh, the brain behind this, uh, and uh, Dr. Dave Powdell is uh, uh, also equally part of this. And plus, you can see uh, tremendous uh, uh, other talents uh, in, the, in the pool of speakers here. And uh, although I don't remember uh, meeting or interacting with the current Vice Chancellor, Dr. Uh, Professor Thapalia, but uh, uh, this is an opportunity today to share the podium together and uh, address our respective institutions. Just few things about uh, major objectives. Uh, 
many of uh, the attendees today are already aware of what NAPA stands for and what its mottos are and objectives are. But I'll try to run through uh, those very quickly. Our major, you know, primary uh, mission is uh, agricultural transformation in Nepal. As uh, AFU does, IAS uh, does, uh, other agriculture institutions, uh, Department of Agriculture, everyone. The whole mission is agricultural transformation, either through research, teaching, service, compatible agriculture, policy development, and so forth. NAPA wants to be part of that uh, venture and try to collaborate with uh, every entity that has the same mission that aligns with us. Specifically, we want to focus on sustainable utilization of agriculture and natural resources, scientific research, capacity building uh, for stakeholders, distance teaching symposia and workshops, which we are doing right now. And ultimate goal is technology trans dissemin dissemination and outreach activities in national and international platforms. So uh, we do not have a narrow focus of agriculture to one location, one province or one country. It's more of a global understanding of agricultural knowledge so we can share this information with all the relevant uh, uh, relevant parties. What's our strength? So we talked about uh, Napa does this, that, and other things, and we have uh, a lofty mission. So what? why do we say that? What resources do we have? We don't have building, we don't have money, we don't have resources, but what we have is a tremendous membership uh, of scientists and professionals in all agriculture and allied sciences. When I say agriculture is so broad, animal husbandry, forestry, you name it. Veterinary science, I mean, it's a wide, uh, broad agriculture umbrella. So we have nearly 400 members. Current good standing members are close to 300, 283 specifically. We have membership from Canada, Australia, Mexico, and Nepal. Uh, in Nepal, currently, we have 56 members. And because our uh, Napa's actual karma bhumi is Nepal, Therefore, we want to uh, enhance the, the membership of Nepalese agriculture professionals in Napa uh, as we move forward. So I urge all of you to join hands in this mission. Uh, we are, US membership uh, spans over 41 states out of 50. We have a robust executive committee representing uh, all uh, areas of expertise and uh, age group and uh, so forth. And there are several subcommittees, for example, specifically for um, the outreach symposia, workshop type uh, programs are run by uh, a specific committee on distance teaching learning uh, uh, program activities. Few points of accomplishments uh, just to demonstrate uh, what types of things NAPA has been doing and uh, what it uh, engages in. Uh, we successfully completed many research projects and academic scholarships uh, the last couple of years. Uh, and we also had, uh, we were asked to provide input on uh, National Planning Commission's 15th five-year agri-sector plan. We provided the feedback, uh, collective feedback from our NAPA members. Uh, we were asked to uh, help with the postgraduate curriculum development in uh, at IAS, which uh, we did, phase one is completed. Uh, we can render such service to AFU uh, if and when asked. Uh, we are engaged in distance teaching and advisory services in several agricultural institutions in Nepal, AFU being one. Uh, professional development webinars, we have delivered uh, 20 plus and one is scheduled next week with the Secretary of Agriculture of Nepal and uh, we engage in lots of uh, professional publications. Talking about research collaboration, uh, we had 35 research proposals uh, submitted uh, two years ago. AFU, uh, mostly students, uh, submitted 17, and you can see we had selected 15 of those uh, funded, and AFU had eight. So uh, we just uh, completed our review of those final reports and uh, they were just awesome, those were exceptional, and you can tune in those, uh, uh, those presentations at our NAPA website. Uh, 
also. All should be there. And we hope to work with uh, local advisors of those research uh, uh, students uh, who were funded and perhaps uh, help publish those uh, research uh, in uh, refereed publication. And we publish quarterly newsletter called AgriConnection to make sure that uh, our members are uh, abreast of uh, uh, lots of information uh, that uh, the current information in agriculture. And we also uh, publish uh, periodically uh, what we call is uh, research and policy briefs. Uh, so these are science-based uh, and uh, kind of experience-based uh, people, uh, uh, those who are working in specific areas of agriculture policy, we ask them to write uh, ag policy papers and we publish. And you can see some here and they are all on our Napa website, napaamericas.org. And we have our own uh, Global Journal of Agriculture and Allied Sciences, GGS. Uh, we had inaugural publication in 2019. Uh, our volume two will be publishing this month. Uh, and I serve as uh, editor-in-chief of this journal and I urge uh, and request all the listeners to consider GGS as venue for your scientific publication. And it is a double-blind, pretty rigorous uh, publication uh, and we hope to have good international standard. And last week, uh, Heart of the Press, uh, we published uh, one book uh, called Principles and Practices of Food Security, Sustainable, Sufficient, and Safe Food for Healthy Living in Nepal. Uh, Dr. Drona Rasali uh, and Prem Mandari were the, uh, the major contributors uh, in terms of uh, editing this book. I was also one of the uh, junior editors. And we are very proud of this publication. In the last four years of establishment of society, we, uh, we could uh, actually publish 400 plus page uh, food security book. Uh, we hope to serve, we hope to have this book serve as a textbook uh, for uh, sustainability type courses and food security and those kinds of things. And hopefully uh, faculty members at AIFU today uh, who are listening to this presentation consider at least to uh, look at this book and see if you can uh, use this as your uh, reference material or textbook. And this book should be uh, should be in market soon. This is still in press, but it's published. Uh, we, we, we were sent a picture of a uh, uh, stack of this uh, coming out uh, last week. What are the Napa resources and current effort that uh, allow us to do these kinds of things? I alluded to you before that it's all membership driven. We have just the members. We don't have any other resources building, no nothing, no other money coming from anywhere. But you know, clearly what we have is expertise in all types of agriculture and allied science disciplines and sub-disciplines. And also uh, added benefit is now uh, we have everywhere good uh, internet capability so we can deliver our resources uh, uh, remotely so we don't have to physically uh, be in Nepal to serve Nepal's agriculture. Couple of examples just to show, I'm not gonna go in detail here, but uh, we had pilot project of doing online teaching experience from Okaldunga. We had successful uh, case there. We went to West uh, Solan district. We did IAC uh, uh, 10 plus two type uh, teaching, junior junior college type teaching successfully. Uh, here are a few you know, students and you know really good delivery. Uh, and currently, uh, Dr. Prem Mandari, our uh, former uh, society secretary, is uh, teaching one course called An Introduction to Survey Data Analysis, uh, currently. Uh, and uh, he has like a five or six different universities, uh, students uh, involved in this. Really, it's uh, uh, from east to west of Nepal, uh, all uh, folks are tuning in. Uh, so it's, it's a remarkable experience that uh, we, are, we are seeing through our online teaching effort. Uh, and uh, uh, since uh, Dr. Kardaria is uh, part of this, uh, I'm just gonna, uh, I'll be kind of preaching to the choir here, but the last two years, uh, uh, biotechnology course for MSc students was held at AFU Center for Biotechnology. Dr. Ananda Achare, <clears throat> former joint secretary, who is also the uh, the major contributor or uh, uh, 
the coordinator of uh, NAPA's Joint Symposium today, uh, conducted an online bioinformatics course in collaboration with the uh, director, Dr. Kadaria. And uh, he reported that he had nine students and faculty members uh, and ran the program for three months. Uh, they did lectures through Zoom conference and even did hands-on analysis and computation over cloud computing resources. You can see uh, one, one slide here. Of course, uh, many of you, including me, uh, won't know what it is, but uh, I only say that it's very sciencey. So uh, really, the, honestly, uh, we, uh, we can do a lot of things with the capability, computing capability we have today. So uh, everything is possible here. And going back, I'm going to throw this slide one more time uh, to, uh, to, to transition saying that uh, two years, uh, the last two years, uh, uh, Dr. Anand Acharya and uh, Dr. Kadaria uh, started teaching course in a small course in bioinformatics and that uh, kind of graduated to now having a really a full-fledged uh, uh, seminar and hands-on experience with 400 people participating. I think that in itself is a, is a remarkable achievement that uh, the two, these two gentlemen have achieved. And uh, uh, NAPA also takes a great pride in uh, these uh, successful uh, collaborative ventures. Okay, toward the end here, uh, what are the opportunities? What can we do? Uh, I think by now you see that we can do a lot of things with the resources we have there and resources we have with, uh, with us, human resources we have uh, within NAPA. Uh, we can clearly demonstrate, we have demonstrated that we can do lots of research collaboration, uh, either through mini research grants uh, uh, or already existing research projects, uh, degree seeking student research, thesis research, and any other unfunded uh, research also we can do collaboratively. Teaching, we could teach a full course in some cases, but most commonly, um, very easily, we can do lots of guest lectures on a specific topic. We could co-teach a course, uh, partnering with, uh, uh, with a specific uh, complementary type uh, expertise there and with NAPA. And we can develop short courses, modular courses. And of course, uh, we offer you the opportunity to, to serve on postgraduate student research committee also. I think Dr. Prem Mandari is already serving on one student right there, at least one example I know of. Uh, we can do uh, symposia and workshops just like this. This is, I hope this is only the first of many symposia and workshops we'll be conducting down the road. Uh, we can do on uh, scientific writing or uh, biostatistics, you name it. We can do all kinds of symposia and workshop. Yeah, it doesn't have to be five days. Sometimes we can do one day workshop. We can do panel and so forth. Uh, Dr. Kadari has just mentioned uh, a while ago. And we could offer adjunct professorship uh, in, the, in the area that uh, you lack uh, uh, those resources. So these are only the few of the things that I listed here. There could be, and there could be many more. But the bottom line is, we all have singular goal. That goal is to enhance the academic excellence in Nepal's agricultural enterprise. And that is through collaborative role. With that, I'll stop because uh, uh, there is a website here, napaamericas.org. Uh, so a lot of things uh, that you can, you can educate yourself uh, about Napa uh, going through the website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Prajuli, for a rem remarkable uh, keynote address regarding uh, what uh, NAPA is doing. Uh, now, without delay, I would like to invite the Vice Chancellor of Agriculture and Forest University, Professor Dr. Sarada Thapalia, uh, to deliver the keynote address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Himal. Uh, Oh, thank you very much. Screen share. Hello. 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 
कि बहुत आए ना मॉर्निंग टू एवरीवन इज माय स्क्रीन इज विजिबल टू एवरीवन Yeah. Is it visible to everyone? Yes. If you can start the slide, so it will be great. Good morning to everyone. Uh, I am very happy uh, to be here in this uh, applied bioinformatics in agriculture and medicine. and i really be uh, be uh, acquainted with the activities conducted by napa uh, i have heard previously but i did not know that uh, such activities are conducted and uh, supporting to our university i really very happy and want to thank to uh, napa members president and all the active members uh, with this i also want to just uh, Give very brief introduction of agriculture and forestry university. Agriculture and forestry university is a state-owned and technical university and is established in 2010 with the objective of producing skilled human resource to change the social economic conditions of rural people through the feeding research and extensive agriculture livestock and forestry. The, this university has got. Three faculties: Faculty of Agriculture, Faculty of Animal Science, Veterinary Science, and Fisheries. That is located in Rampur, and Faculty of Forestry is located in Hedora. It has got 266 hectare of land in Rampur and 95 hectare of land in Hedora. And teaching uh, faculty, you can see 233 positions and. Uh, out of this 120 only is fulfilled and 47 and 66 here you can see this is in uh, red letter this is not here fulfilled and here we are lacking the human resource faculty member and here napa can help us i by the present uh, the presentation of president of napa i am really very happy here we can you can help for the uh delivery of the lecture of uh, the research and um guiding to the students uh about the constituent college after the establishment of university uh, we have we are able to establish few constituent college throughout the country so it, this is in pakribas udaipur sindhuli mohotari uh, chandli gorkha samja and dalhi here, here is still to open and in kaski road pa bake and kalari here we have already established constituent college so by this we can say that the presence of agriculture and forestry university is throughout the country and in addition to that it has got affiliated colleges also that is also in dhapa itari ramnagar kolpur surkhet lalitpur and naval parasi and i think you already acquainted and you know about the program that is conducted uh, in agriculture and forestry university that is faculty of forestry has a bachelor level program bscd and post graduate level mscd Uh, that is run by 14 department and is by 11 departments likewise faculty of animal science veterinary science and fisheries runs two undergraduate program that is bbs and ar and bsc fisheries and eight department runs msc animal science msc mbsc and psc program uh, in five departments and uh, faculty of forestry also runs bachelor level bsc forestry and msc forestry and psc forestry i just want to share this um increasing number of the student uh, enrollment in uh, university 
from starting 2016 and 17 by 170 students and now we have got 1162 students per year in four months. I want to say that this increasing number of um, female students in this university. That is very, uh, we are very much encouraged by the number of female students increment in this university. Here, 63% male and 37% female. Few new programs we have added after the establishment of agriculture and forestry university. That is MSc Agronomy, Seed Science and Technology, MSc Agronomy, Wheat Science, MSc in Active Business Management, MSc in Biotechnology, and uh, this is BSc Agriculture Engineering. We have already um, prepared the curriculum, and uh, MSc Dairy Technology also curriculum is already ready. BSc Fisheries Research Program has already established, uh, started, and now we are in the pipeline to uh, start the BSc Horticulture. About the research activity conducted in university, that is uh, externally funded projects in and internally funded projects, um, 40 projects are ongoing. Uh, 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 Directorate of Research and Extension has published Journal of Agriculture and uh, uh, Forestry University. Uh, it, uh, our uh, third volume has been already published, and now fourth volume very soon we will uh, publish fourth volume also. And about this uh, uh, prospectus of uh, establishing land grant university model, last year we have conducted one conference to um, to make the policy about the land grant university uh, and uh, which type of land grant um, model should be adopted by agriculture and forest university. And other publications are uh, the annual report by Dorex and the few uh, research outcomes that is published in uh, Nepali language and that is uh, uh, taken as extension material to the farmers. This seed processing unit is another very unique program, unique uh, uh, project of agriculture and forestry university. And this was uh, started by the uh, seed system initiative delivering genetic gain in wheat. It was uh, supported by Cornell University and uh, Sadhguru uh, Management Consultant India and Nepal. Our university has established seed village model uh, with the uh, initiation of very few numbers of farmers. And now we have reached more than 280 farmers in a group to produce rice and wheat See. Now, if we go to uh, enter into the Center of Biotechnology, uh, which is uh, actively involved to, um, to publish, uh, to conduct the uh, workshop and this, uh, this type of webinar. And here now also very actively they are working and conducting this type, this, this webinar. And the, uh, the center has got currently running MSc AG Biotechnology, MBSc Biotechnology and PhD. And the program has already approved but yet to start. That is MSc Animal Science Biotechnology and MSc Forestry. It has got a few uh, unit. Uh, that is molecular unit, cell culture unit, tissue culture unit, microbiology unit, biochemistry unit, laboratory animal facility, animal ex experiment, uh, unit and refrigeration and autoclave unit. Uh, biotechnology, our center of biotechnology has got a dream to uh, go through the, to the uh, farmers and uh, research and that has been now uh, coming in um, light by integrated research laboratory. So the research focus of this uh, center is genomics molecular bio diagnostic tissue culture where i think we can do uh, joint project joint activity joint proposal writing and bidding 
and academics new pg program in analytical biochemistry bioinformatics and service extension so by this uh, integrated the research laboratory this integrated research lab is uh, funded by uh, university university grant commission uh, and this is under center of biotechnology and it has got uh, five disciplines analytical science food and nutrition microbiology biotechnology molecular biology and to bring the result in analytical analysis nutritional analysis food safety residue analysis molecular diagnostic vaccine production tissue culture and cell and embryo culture this is to produce a sufficiently powerful um, advances in science and to uh, increase the revenue also to the university and these are the few uh, activities uh, of center of biotechnology uh, just after the uh, outbreak of the covid uh, this university and especially biotechnology department took the initiation to establish the uh, covid lab in varakur uh, digital diagnostic lab in varakur and it produces the sanitizer a uh, hand sanitizer and uh, you can see our uh, director of the uh, center of biotechnology was uh, one of the human resource to run the um, covid 19 laboratory established in varakur uh, after the establishment of uh, center it was uh, actively involved in the uh to conduct different um conferences and you can see the national conference on biotechnology policy and application it was a very uh, uh this was um, uh, very encouraging participation and support from the nepal government also uh, to make this uh, um, conference possible and after the conference uh, we got very um, uh, collaborative work with the uh, biotechnology Uh, professionals in present in Nepal, and similarly, international workshop also with the initiation and active participation of center, we were we were able to um, conduct the international workshop on pulmonary vascular disease in Nepal. And after the uh, uh, this, our team um, uh, took the lead in. um university we were actively uh, present in different um provinces of nepal collaboration with the tr government local government provinces government and central government and with local government we are now uh, uh, discussing about to support the program of government by uh, by um, giving our faculty students to run the program in local level likewise provinces uh, to the provinces also almost all uh, seven with seven provinces we have done mou and different research activities are going to be supported by um, provinces government one of the example is establishment of biosecurity lab plus two lab in this university bagmati province has uh, uh, um put uh, come forward to supporting us uh, by giving more than 15 crore uh, money to establish this biosecurity level 2 lab so our university now uh, taking the uh, dream of three uh, project now bio um, this uh, center of biotechnology is also is one of our uh, flagship project and seed vehicle model, model and likewise this biosecurity lab after the establishment we will be able to conduct uh, world class research and service to the farmer uh, thank you very much for giving this opportunity to share the uh, to introduce uh, agriculture and forestry university and to be acquainted with the activity of uh, napa and i am very uh, happy to be present in this uh, this uh, next uh, 
um, technical sessions also. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, respected Vice Chancellor AFU, for delivering uh, the keynote uh, speech. Now we will jump into the um, uh, these technical talks. And uh, to introduce the technical talks, I would like to request uh, Dr. Dev uh, to uh, brief about the technical talks and how it goes and then start the technical uh, session. Dr. Dev. Thank you, Dr. Luitel. So, uh, folks, we, we have uh, four speakers today in the technical session. And uh, as the session moves forward, I'll be introducing uh, each of them. And then uh, we will go directly into the talks because we are uh, really short on time. So first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Ananta Acharya, who is a scientist at Corteva Agri Sciences, to uh, give his talk. Dr. Acharya. Thank you, Dr. Dev. Okay, uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes, you are good. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this kind of started uh, is, okay, let's do something. Now we have Zoom and all these kind of things. So let's do uh, something where reaching out mass community. And then we started this one and we got more than 400 resistance. And uh, some of the resistance may not be Nepali speaker, and uh, in the discussions later, we might be using a lot of Nepali words and we, we might be uh, working in Nepali. So please bear with us, uh, we'll, we, but we'll try to be in English for most of the technical sessions. Uh, I'll start from uh, my brief introduction. So I graduated from uh, Rampur. Uh, I, at that uh, time, it was IES in Tribune University. Uh, most of it is probably now AFU and is still some part of it as TU. Uh, uh, and then uh, I did my, I completed my uh, master's in plant breeding uh, in 2008 in University of Florida. Then I uh, did my PhD in genetics and genomics uh, in 2014. And then I started as a scientist in uh, Tao Agrosciences at that time. And then now it is called Quoteva Agriscience. Uh, it is a merger from the Tao Agriscience and the Tupan Pioneer. So, First of all, I just want to talk about the motivation. And from this motiv uh, motivation, it was it started with like every a lot of speakers have already said about said about this one. It started with my collaboration with uh, Dr. Corderia from Center for Biotechnology. And today, I really want to thank Dr. Corderia, also um, Vice Chancellor Madam uh, Sardatha Palia, uh, and and Mixer for uh, giving us keynote speakers and introducing us. So. It, 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 is, it is our great pleasure to present this in front of so much of audience and the people who can actually make differences uh, in Nepal in education. So uh, we are really glad that we can uh, share some of our experiences here. Uh, oops. Uh, so, and, and then, uh, I was joint secretary and I'm still active member of NAPA. So then we said, okay, why not do this as, as a NAPA, as an organization and not just the biotechnology or biomatics or genomics. Can we take it further? And then, okay, uh, and biomatics can be one of the role model. And that's how we started. And then now we are seeing a lot of webinars, Zoom, Google, uh, Google Talks and everything. So uh, now everyone, everyone or most of the people, even in Nepal, we used to do a lot of face-to-face -face communications or in phone, now we are comfortable with the Zoom. So let's do it. So that was another motivation. And, and another motivation, and you, you, you really see why uh, we have a hands-on experience in uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus, because we, it, it got so much of interest. And, and biomedicine is such a subject that it is not limited by agriculture or, or, or one uh, specific field. So it can be extended to either agriculture, animal science, evolution, evolutionary sciences, medical sciences, and so on. We will we'll go on that later. So that is another reason we said, okay, let's work on this one. And let's also give some examples of what's going on with the coronavirus or the COVID. 
so let me briefly talk about how how Pyramid is came. And if you look at this timeline, and if you look at if, if you have look, uh, looked into the biology, general biology, we have talked about the uh, uh, Charles Darwin principles, Mendel's principles, and different kind of things, Watson and Crick, and those kind of things. When you when we go to the molecular biology and what actually gave birth to the, all the sequencing and biomimetics, it is that the probably the discovery of the nuclein, what is now known as DNA in 1872, probably drives a lot of this. Then in 1904, there is a chromosome theory of heredity. So how things passed from one generation to another generation. And in 1910, uh, Dr. Uh, Ocell, he found out that A, T, C, G, and U are those nucleotides. They are comprising either in DNA or RNA. And then 1953, most of you know, most of us know, Watson and Crick's very famous double helix model. And then we, we have also heard about the central dogma and from the central dogma theory, double helix DNA then translates to the protein and, and to the amino acids. And that is where uh, Nirenborg and Dr. Korana, they establish the term codon and the three nucleic acids converts into the amino acid and that's what the trans, uh, translation happens. And then what really kicked off the biomimetics is sequencing. And Dr. Frederick Sanger, uh, he, he developed the Sanger sequencing. And more, Sanger sequencing is still a gold standard in sequencing. It is still used a lot, but it is uh, not probably very high throughput. That is the one of the main problem. And then, PCR. Now we are hearing a lot about this PCR because of the coronavirus and the test. So PCR is one of the key for all the molecular biology experiments and sequencing. Then in 1990, Human Genome Project was launched. In 2001, first draft of Human Genome was published. And in 2003, I think it was completed. And in 2007, the next generation sequencing, uh, we started with Solexa, uh, Illumina, uh, rose pop hypo and those machines so what happened next is we had a data problem we had so much of data so if you look at the data growth uh, we, we always used to say this is astronomical or uh, when you have to talk about the hues we used to say it's astronomical now people have started saying it's genomic because the genomic sequences are probably there are a lot more things than in the astronomical uh, whole history, whole uh, universe now. So the scale on the uh, y-axis here is in log. That is why this 0, 1, 2, 3, it's not a linear, it's, it's a log scale. So if you look at this first Sanger sequence from the uh, Sanger sequence around this 2004, 5 uh, from the human genome, 2001, at that time in what is deposited in the, in the NCBI, very few sequencing. And this sequencing really kicked off. It was a linear kind of, and then it really kicked off after 2007 when that 454 and Illumina came. And then now we have so much of data that we don't really, we, we, we are creating so much of data that sometimes we are lost within the data and we, we, we don't know what's next. So, so how, what is that data? How that data is created? Let me go back and revise some of the molecular biology. Uh, here we have example of a human, but it's also true for any living beings, uh, uh, animal, in the animal science or in the crop science. We have cells, within the cells we have, we have the nucleus, in the nucleus we have chromosomes, and depending upon the organ organism, the chromosomes are, there are different numbers of chromosomes, and these chromosomes are, uh, but are kind of compacted with different level of compaction. And then they actually make up the DNA, which is very compacted, but that DNA ultimately trans trans makes the RNA, and that RNA ultimately makes the protein. And that protein defines a lot of the metabolic pathway or uh, defines the structure of the pro structure of anything like even even in the coronavirus what we are saying that is spikes and the s protein that is a protein and those kind of things so that's how everything is coded back in the dna in the cell and that analyzing that data of the dna 
that is that genomics and that is the uh, bioinformatics. How we analyze the data, that is bioinformatics. So let's go back to and look into this one. So we have that genome, that's the DNA. We have transcriptome, that is RNA, and the proteome, that is the proteins, and the met all the metabolites which come, come from different physiological pathways. In conventional molecular biology, we knew about a gene, or let's say we knew about some sequence, then we tracked their RNA or different isoforms of the RNA, and then we also tracked the protein, uh, their expression and protein, and then their uh, translation, their ultimate uh, metabolites. And then we said, okay, this is our hypothesis, This we think this is the way it goes, and we started making those, looking at those kind of experiments. Then came the era of single omics. So in the genomics, we looked, started looking at all the different positions of the gene, genome, and then we said, okay, we, it has a mutation, it has a SNP, it has some structural variations and those kind of things. And then we also looked at the transcriptome, rna seq and then okay this rna is expressed in the root this is expressed in uh, hair this is expressed when somebody is sick and those kind of things and same with the protein proteome all the protein and the uh, we we started okay we see uh, this dalton protein from this one so i think it has this uh, this bounding property and those kind of things and all these antibodies and those kind of things uh, and had their interaction with the protein right and then similarly with the metabolites and right now we are in this transomics era now we don't just look at to the genomics we don't just look at the dna itself or the rna itself we now try to define the problem and find the answers from all this transomics. What biomedics actually is, is not just the computer science, it's not just the biology, and it is also not just the statistics and mathematics, and it is combination of all of these one. So, if you look at a lot of biomedicians, uh, if you know some people, you will see many people go from biology, many people also go from computer science, and many people also go from the math and the stats. So when you can apply all this knowledge, you can be expert in one side of the field, but have some knowledge on the other side of the fields, then in, you can be the biomedicine. So like this one I was uh, talking all, uh, earlier, we have a, uh, in classical biology, we made some hypothesis, then we generated the data, very low throughput data, and then we said, oh, okay, we reject the hypothesis or we, uh, confirm the hypothesis. Now in the genomic science, we have so much of data. We do a genome sequencing and we have billions of data and we do the sequencing and let's say, oh, okay, let's think, okay, let's make a hypothesis that this gene in particular, this chromosome, this might have um, this function in crop development. Uh, this might be resist, this crop might be resistant because we are seeing this sequence. Again, you can take the same data, but just from the other chromosome, other region and say, oh, okay, this might be what making a crop a dwarf for the tall and those kind of things. So from the same data, you can actually come up with different hypotheses. And from that high throughput data, you can start that hypothesis generation and confirm and reject those hypotheses. So again, in bioinformatics, you, it can be a computational. Uh, you, you, you develop the algorithms, you develop softwares, you make databases, you, you curate the databases, and you also visualize uh, the data. And it can be applied. And, and I think a lot of us uh, today speaking here are on applied biometric session, who we, we, we do mostly uh, sequence analysis or uh, functional analysis or the structural analysis. So I don't want you to remember all these things, but I can guarantee that from all the speakers today, tomorrow, and next few days, you will be hearing about these terms again and again. That is why, and again, earlier, my earlier slides, you are, you are going to see that again and again, because without the, these are the basics of what makes the biomedics. So you will hear a lot of the ohms, genome, transcriptome, proteome, metabolome. You will hear a lot of the sequencing technologies, Sanger, Illumina, PacBio, a lot of the databases, you will hear about a lot of programs and you will hear a lot about how do we actually apply all this knowledge to uh, our research or answer. So with that, what is next is 
we are today in we, we are going to cover very general in what is the application of biomedics uh, biomedics applications in animal science and evolutionary studies we are also going to cover uh, in what is the application in plant science and in medicine and after that tomorrow we are going to so today will be very overview very high level we'll not go to the, a lot of the details and the technical details uh, maybe some of them tomorrow it will it will be a more technical detail so we'll we'll talk about the how actually what the coronavirus genome looks like we'll compare the coronavirus genome of Wuhan and Nepal and US and what was like six months ago versus now we'll start talking about those you might have heard some of the mutations in the coronavirus we are going to talk about the mutations of the coronavirus that is going to come tomorrow and we are also going to talk about the rise and and some of the genomics and diversity of rice that doesn't mean what we only chose these examples just because we had to introduce the application in some plant science and some medicine but that means what we are actually trying to say is we can actually cover anything so and and it can be applied to any crop any biological uh, organisms uh, and then the next three days we'll do a hands-on that was our plan but the response is so overwhelming that we cannot do the hands-on so it will be more of demo but some of you if you feel you are very comfortable with linux uh, let us know uh, and and we will uh, provide you the uh, usernames and password uh, to our cloud computing system and you can actually do the hands-on so like i said you have to, we, we may not have time to go through all the basics of the linux um, in these three days but we hope that you will learn something from that demo. So that is the next for that five days or three days. But what really next is, again, I'm really happy that Mixer and uh, Mixer and um, uh, Sarda Madam both emphasize that we can actually collaborate. We can actually collaborate and work on a lot of different things. So one of the major purpose of this one is, okay, let's do uh, not just one time seminar, let's do more collaboration either the teaching collaboration or the research collaboration and we can do that so and and finally i want to really thank um uh sangeet uh, uh dev uh Saros and sisir radhika they helping me uh, you know we started this one but uh, probably towards the end they probably work more than me to finally deliver this one so thank you very much Okay, with this, uh, to you, Dr. Dev. Thank you, Dr. Acharya, for the wonderful introduction of uh, bioinformatics and genomics. And now I'd like to now I'd like to invite Dr. Uh, Sangeet Lamichane, who is an assistant professor at Kent State University, in order to uh, deliver his uh, seminar. Dr. Lamichane, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I am hoping everybody can listen to me and see my slides. Yes. Uh, respected dignitaries, uh, faculty members, my other colleagues, students, and uh, all the audience who is listening to me, thank you all for joining. Uh, first, I would especially thank the organizing team uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk here today. And I have been asked to talk about uh, applications of genomics and bioinformatics. In, in our field of animal science and uh, evolutionary biology. Uh, I'm Sangeet, uh, currently an assistant professor at uh, Kent State University in, in USA. And in addition, I also hold a, a research fellow position at Harvard University, also in USA. But today, I thought that perhaps I should keep aside all these uh, fancy affiliations of mine and maybe introduce myself uh, as just an alumni from Rampur because I am myself a graduate from Rampur. Uh, so I was a batch of 2003-2008 uh, uh, BBAC and EH program. I guess you can find the most uh, thinnest guy in the picture. That's me. Uh, that was kind of long time ago. And uh, uh, even though this uh, platform today is virtual, I, I am really feeling special giving a talk today because I feel that with a, a great majority of audience from Rampur, I am currently really feeling that I am actually back to Rampur, back to the back to home, where it all began for me. So it's uh, very exciting to uh, talk today. 
And in addition, I'm really happy that I'm sharing this platform with our respected Vice Chancellor, Dr. Thapalia, because uh, uh, I was not just a student of uh, Dr. Thapalia in the class, but uh, Dr. Thapalia, maybe she remembers, uh, was also my immediate uh, uh, supervisor for my intensive research project. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the BBS and ES program, you have to do this uh, intensive research. And uh, she was advising me to uh, work on wild buffaloes at Kositapu Wildlife Reserve. That was my smallest uh, intensive research. I mean, it, it was a very small research, so nothing important to talk about today. But when I think about that uh, intensive research uh, now, I, I, I realized that perhaps that was the first exposure that I got into the field of wildlife uh, doing my intensive research. And then slowly perhaps that exposure uh, led to my interest in biodiversity evolution. And then with my integration of uh, studies in genomics during my higher education, uh, perhaps uh, this has led to my career in evolutionary genomics. So needless to say, Rampur has indeed become the main platform for me um, and, and, and a kind of a launching pad. Um, so I would use this opportunity to thank Dr. Thapalia and the entire Rampur family uh, because I think that whatever I have achieved at this point in my career has all been uh, due to Rampur. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. So coming back to my talk, um, I would like to start by a quote from our very own uh, Gautam Buddha, who had said, nothing is permanent. And uh, the only universal constant uh, in life is actually a change. And this change is actually what uh, we call evolution. So I think we all know evolution are the changes in the heritable characteristics of any biological populations uh, over successive generations. And, uh, this evolution is, I think, the only constant that we have. I mean, when we know that uh, the Earth was formed about 4.5 billion years ago, and 4.5 billion years ago and now, I think every day this planet is undergoing change. Every species in this planet are undergoing change, including us humans. So evolution is, I think, one of the, the underlying factor of the, uh, the whole planet that we are living in. But when I talk about evolution, the most common question that people ask me is, why do we care evolution? What's the application of evolution? What's go, what, what do we gain by studying evolution? And I think my answer for them is that, of course, I think as I said in, in my previous slide, uh, we need to understand where life came from and uh, that will help us to predict where the life is going to, right? Look, I mean, this is the mother of all the other knowledge that we want to learn about this, uh, this planet. And I think that's why we, evolution is so very important. And in today's world, I think when we talk about evolution, we talk a lot about biodiversity. And that leads to the other question that people ask me is, why do we care biodiversity? Why do we need biodiversity? And, uh, but most of the people who ask me this question uh, tend to realize that we human, are the most superior species in this planet. And all the other species that we have around us, they are just not important as, as human. But that's the main mistake that we make because uh, uh, humans are not the most superior species, but we are just a part of the ecosystem, just a part of the entire biodiversity of this planet. And what better time to highlight the importance of biodiversity than current time where we are all struggling with this uh, global COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I think all of us agree that th this COVID-19 had just uh, been the result of our careless handling of biodiversity. All this uh, disease transmission that we are seeing, uh, including COVID-19 from animals to humans, and all this uh, genotic emergence that we are seeing currently, is all just because of our careless handling of biodiversity. So again, this can, uh, there is no better time than highlighting about biodiversity than today. Uh, and that's why we need to understand biodiversity. It has to be in our curriculum. It has to be in our, in our research because I think that's the key thing uh, that we need to understand to save this planet and save our, our future. So when we talk about evolution, when we talk about biodiversity, uh, there are two major things. 
that we need to need to understand evolution or biodiversity the first question that we need to understand is why did this evolution happen why 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 do we see this change all the time and the second question is how did it happen like what are the underlying mechanisms of uh, this enormous biodiversity that we see or this evolution that we have are, have are seeing all the time and the why question is i think pretty straightforward and i think that has already been solved so thanks to all our famous scientists in the past including mr charles darwin and his famous theory of evolution by natural selection i think we now have a good grasp on like um, how uh, a variation among a species is so critical for uh, for evolution and how the species utilize these uh, variations to for competition and survival survival among them uh, and to survive in the challenging environment and because of this competition in uh, the process of uh, survival of the fittest and there ha it have the next thing that happens is uh, adaptation and this adaptation uh, due to natural selection is the key part of evolution so why it's happening we all know it's because of competition and it's all because of uh, what charles darwin uh, told in his theory of evolution so this this thing is almost uh, almost settled at this point the core question that we are asking in today's time is how did it happen what are the underlying mechanisms of evolution and this how question is something that even mr charles darwin had no clue about so this is this there is this famous saying what darwin didn't know and so he proposed all this famous uh, theory on, on evolution but in fact he had no idea like what was the underlying mechanism uh, in the organism that was driving this uh, uh, evolutionary processes and it was only after a while uh, because of this famous work from greg mandel i think we all know from our high school biology with his famous work on um, on peas and he proposed this laws of genetics and then when we started combining darwin's theory and mendel's theory so now we start to then we started to realize that to un understand evolution the underlying mechanism where we were perhaps the genes in our 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 cell and that is driving evolution so this was known that perhaps we need to understand genes to understand evolution so when that happened the second question then we asked was like okay we know that it's in the genes but how do the genes look like so how how do we study those genes and uh, again i am recording the similar uh, uh, information that dr acharya uh, talked about before me so the first important thing that was the, we identified was this famous discovery of dna structure uh, it was a nobel prize winning work from watson and crick back in 1953 so we knew about the dna structure back like 50 years ago ago but it took almost more than 50 years for us to realize that the actual core thing that we need to look into the genes or the dna is actually the the dna sequence which is the underlying thing that we need to understand about uh, when we study the dna so we can say dna sequence is actually the blue blueprint of life that's what we have to learn about and as dr acharya said the the all the interest in this last uh, 10 20 years has been to understand the the, the sequence of the dna and the method that we use for, to do this is called dna sequencing so to make it in a, in a very less technical way you can think the dna as a book that you are reading and then when you read every word in the book every letter in the book that is letter is your dna sequence so to under, uh, as you read the book by uh, page by page by letter by letter and word by word it's exactly the same when we do dna sequencing we want to read the the sequence of the entire dna word by word and base by base so basically to summarize what what we can say is that to understand the genes we have to in fact sequence the, the dna to sequence the the genomes so again i'm talking the same thing as dr acharya said already so to to to, to do the dna sequencing the first method that came up uh, uh, in the field was called the sanger sequencing it was a very a low throughput primitive type of sequencing which was able to sequence small pieces of dna so perhaps one uh, one run of sanger sequencing would sequence about 1000 bases um, of, of dna and perhaps you can think 1000 bases a small piece of a gene a gene or a 
in, in some case, a, a full gene. So again, this was a very low throughput method. But now, when you think about Sanger sequencing in a bigger picture, let's talk, think about a human DNA, which is called a genome. So a human DNA will have 4 billion base pairs, uh, which will have more than 25,000 genes. So now think about like one single Sanger sequencing run that will only give you 1,000 base pair that you can divide by uh, with, in, with uh, 4 billion base pairs. Then you can imagine like how much time it would take to sequence a small gene to sequence the entire genome. And that was the major challenge in our field for a very long time, how we can sequence in a better way. Uh, but, but again, as Dr. Achari said, uh, the first thing we wanted to learn when we knew about sequencing was, of course, we wanted to know about our own genome, that's our human nature. So back in 1990, uh, this big uh, uh, publicly funded project in the, U in the US was launched. So it was called a Human Genome Project. And the goal of this project was to sequence the entire, uh, entire sequence, entire basis of, uh, of human DNA. And again, this was a very ambitious project that was uh, uh, done just based on Sanger sequencing method. So what they did was they took the entire DNA and you can think about a scissor. So basically they cut small pieces of every portion of DNA, which we call clones in, in technical term. So they, we made like they made hundreds and thousands of clones from the uh, from the DNA entire DNA sequence, and then each clone was uh, sequenced uh, using a separate Sanger sequencing run. So uh, it, there were it was like hundreds and thousands of sequencing run that was used to sequence the entire human genome back in. Uh, so it took more than fifteen years to actually finish this. Uh, project because again you can imagine like uh, using Sanger sequencing to sequence hundreds and thousands of clones simultaneously indeed takes a long time but when this uh, sequencing was done uh, this was a big news it was a massive news so in US still people believe that uh, sequencing a human genome is the second greatest achievement of USA first being the the Neil Armstrong landing on the moon in Apollo 11. So it was a massive, uh, massive door opening thing. It was, a, it was considered the biggest achievement. It was all over the news. Everybody was talking about, about human genome. It was published in Nature. So the Nature is one of the top journal in our field of science. So yeah, it was, it, was a, it was considered a big, big achievement. But when you think about this now, the major challenge of uh, human genome sequencing was there were three, three things. One, it took forever. So it took more than 15 years to complete this project. And then it was not possible by just one lab or one university to sequence this uh, human genome. So this required massive, massive international collaboration. And the most tricky thing was it was very expensive. So you can realize that sequencing hundreds and thousands of clones all over the world would be very expensive. So just giving you a number, just sequencing one single human DNA uh, cost more than three billion dollars, so it was it was massive. So yeah, so at that point in back in two thousand three, there was a method to sequence, and people used that to sequence human human genome. But people like us who are animal scientists, or people like someone in the audience today who are plant scientists, who are, who have our own model systems, who who work with non-human systems. So there there was the technique available. But as we, as we say, it was so close, but yet too far because we, we could not invest $3 billion to sequence our, our species or, or sequence our animals. Or like we don't have 15 years to, to do that. So it was that, again, it was uh, the sequencing was done, but again, for other species, for non-human species, this was still a big challenge back in 2003. But this thing was back in 2003, but since 2003 till now, now we are in 2020. So in this last 17 years, we have seen a massive, massive thing, what we call a genomic revolution. So there has been this massive revolution in the field of genomics. And there are, there are three major things that changed. The first thing was uh, we now changed the way we could sequence the DNA. Remember, in the earlier days, I talked about the Sanger sequencing, uh, but now, along these last 17 years, we have made 
striking development in the way we can sequence. And this is what we call next generation sequencing. And the major difference between these two approaches is that you can think Sanger sequencing, the old technique, is, as I said before, reading a book. So you have a book, which is a DNA. So you take every page out of the book and you separate each page and then you read every word in the page one by one. That's the very old Sanger sequencing technique. But now, when we talk about next generation sequencing, uh, in a simple way, you can think about a mixer grinder. So let's say like you have a DNA, you take a DNA, you put the entire DNA into a mixer grinder and you just run the grinder, which will produce hundreds and thousands and millions of small fragments of DNA. You will not know which fragment came from which chromosomes, it's completely random, but the technique was just to blindly fragment the entire DNA and then produce some kind of instruments to sequence each small fragment. And there were some big players that came into the market, as you already heard about, for example, Illumina. So Illumina has been the company that is providing the, the most exciting uh, uh, instruments for us to sequence using next generation sequencing. So we had that. So you can realize that this was much easier because now you can uh, sequence uh, simul like uh, do a massively parallel sequencing of all fragments together you don't have to wait like sanger where you do it one by one you can do it all at once so now uh, you can sequence a genome in less than two days uh, compared to like 15 years that that it took uh, to sequence a human genome uh, in back in uh, 2003 so again this was very exciting but the major challenge, as Dr. Achari already said, was like we were getting massive amount of data and the, the data, the sequence, as I said, think about mixer grinder. So it was very fragmented. So we would get a small piece of sequence all over, the, all over the genome, but then we had no clue how do we add them together. So to do that, uh, we required some smart computational methods, some smart computer is computing resources, some smart uh, tools that could stitch these small pieces of uh, DNA fragments together. Think about uh, uh, your puzzle game. You have these hundreds of pieces and you put the, all, all those puzzle pieces together. So it, it was something very similar. We required some puzzle binding kind of uh, tools to, uh, to put all these genomic pieces together. And uh, while it, this was happening, uh, slowly this all uh, method Accumulated in, into a new field of study, which was called bioinformatics, uh, which was uh, the kind of field that was analyzing this all big scale, massively parallel sequencing data. And uh, this is the bioinformatics, is the, as you all know, is the theme of our uh, workshop in this last five days. And you will be hearing about all, all these different aspects of bioinformatics uh, from all, all the speakers uh, along the course of this uh, webinar. So, um, yeah, the first thing was there was a revolutionary change in the, the way we sequence the DNA. The second thing was uh, even the DNA sequencing machines, the instruments that we were using uh, to sequence the genomes, we saw a massive change in that. So it's not just our iPhones which are changing, not just our laptops which are changing, even the DNA sequence machines, uh, thanks to the technology, have been changing over these years. So in the earlier days, we used to have these big instruments, big, uh, big sequencing uh, equipments. Look at these pictures. This is a packed bio machine, one of the sequencing, and you look at the, the size. So the, the size of this machine is almost the size of an adult human. So these were these big machines. It required um, a lot of resources to install in the lab. You, need to, you needed to have a big lab, big um, microbiological laboratory resources to set up these um, uh, instruments. But now uh, we have something different. So nowadays we have other types of sequencers. So the second picture I'm showing here is the small sequencer that you, you can still hold in your hand. So again, this is the same type of sequence that you can sequence a DNA, uh, but now the size is way smaller. So you can simply uh, use this as a pen drive, for example. So you can you connect this sequencer to any ordinary laptop add your uh, DNA sample to the, to the sequencer, start your laptop, and you can sequence the DNA. So now for this, you don't need massive laboratory space to, to keep this. In, you can basically carry this uh, DNA sequencer in your pocket. So this is how the, the, the 
evolution of even the equipment is happening. And this laptop based uh, portable nanopore sequencer, uh, last year I would say this was, this, this was the most recent one, but now we are having even better sequencers. So nowadays we don't even need a laptop. You know, everybody carries a phone, who cares a laptop? So nowadays we have this like even smart sequencer that you can connect to any of your phones. It could be Android, it could be iPhone. And just drop your DNA sample into that small chip, connect that to your uh, my, uh, phone, and you can sequence uh, right from your phone, uh, given like you have enough space in the phone to uh, store the data, or you can directly upload it to clouds. So you can see like how the field is changing. Like nowadays, with these all fancy equipments, uh, it has become way easier to set up a genomic resource in a lab because many things are very portable. And uh, you can already imagine like what could be the application of this portable sequencer. And the one big revolution that has came into the field is now we can, we don't need to do genome sequencing. We don't need big laboratories uh, to do this uh, projects. We can do it in the field. You can just carry your, this small uh, sequencer. You can just take your laptop, just carry some reagents, go to the field, collect the sample, and you can sequence the whatever species that you are interested in, right in the field. You don't even have to bring the samples back to the lab. So again, this gives us very exciting avenues to do a lot, lot more in the field, particularly people like us who are mostly interested in um, um, plant and animal sciences. So again, I myself have a lot of experience of doing this real-time genome sequencing. I have done this in Galapagos, in South America, in Amazonian forests. So Again, like you can just do a hiking in the forest. You can just make a, your, your own tent can be your microbiological laboratory. You don't need any fancy labs to, to do this kind of experiments. This is very, so, so very exciting. So the third thing that happened apart from this was, you may be realizing that maybe things were expensive, but it went on the other way. All these genetic techniques, the reagents, the instruments, they got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And this is one of the famous slide that everybody shows that how the price of uh, uh, genome sequencing is, has been dropping. So on the x-axis, it's the, 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 the time, and the y-axis is just the, the values. And again, I'm showing you a very old slide. I only have data from um, in this slide back from 2015, but in current times, in now in 2020, the, the price has gone even lower. So things have become very, very cheaper. So, so what this means is that the main conclusion from what I'm trying to say here is the genomic research nowadays is not limited to big universities. It's not just Harvard and Stanford and Oxford who are doing genomics research. We can, anybody can do genomics research. So you, you realize that things are cheaper. Um, we can do it much faster. Uh, and we, there are portable sequencer. So we don't need very fancy equipment. So which means that particularly the research in third world countries, like for example, Nepal, can greatly benefit from uh, this genomic revolution because now we don't need a lot of resources to set up a genomic lab um, compared to what we needed maybe let's say 10 years ago. So we just need a, a bit of planning, that's very important. And then of course we need a bit of, a, a bit of expertise. And I don't think we either lack on planning and or, or we, we lack uh, any expertise uh, to set up these kind of facilities, in, for example, in Nepal. So, Again, one of the major take home messages from my talk today is that anybody can do genomics research. It, has, it doesn't have to be the, only the fancy big universities. So just, just remember that. So again, when, when this genomic revolution happened, every field of science benefited. So nowadays everybody is doing genomics. So as we from the field of animal, animal science, uh, we have seen a lot of revolution happening uh, after the arrival of genomics uh, in, in animal science, the, one of the biggest uh, uh, improvement has been and the, the way we are doing animal breeding or, or like artificial animal breeding for commercial, commercial purposes. Because now we don't have to just rely on traditional animal breeding practices or like uh, using quantitative genetics. Now you can directly use this uh, exciting uh, genomic selection methods uh, and use that for your breeding program, so which is uh, giving us very exciting opportunities to meet this very high demand of animal protein in, in a very sustainable and uh, animal friendly way in our current world. So one of the, I think one of the things that we have benefited in animal science is from genomics has been this uh, 
um, animal breeding uh, programs that we can do now. And of course, like uh, as I was saying in the, in, in the beginning, now we can better understand uh, about evolution of a particular animal or, or a overall biodiversity using this, uh, using, using this genomics. And now when I'm talking about uh, animal genomes here, I'm not going into too much details, but uh, this is one of the very important slides. So, so this is a, a database called animalgenome.org. So anybody here in the audience who is interested in working with any types of animals and think that they will be doing some kind of genomics, so if that's the case, I would suggest that this should be your first uh, starting point, uh, going to this animal genome database, because this animal genome database is basically a collection of everything that you require um, to do or any research in animal genomes. So this, this database has all um, bioinformatics resources available, all tools that are available, uh, all the current publications that are happening, all the most current updates on the field of animal, animal genomes, all different types of conference and workshops and webinars that are happening. And most importantly, this, uh, this database also have a list serve. So let's say you are looking for a job, you are looking for a, a position, or and then, then you can get a daily email about like who is requiring a master's student or who is looking for a collaboration. So, so I would say that this should be your, uh, the favorite browser uh, if you are, are interested in animal genomics. So just keep that in mind. And just going back to my own work, so um, myself be working with animal genomes. As I said, my research focus uh, back from my intensive research had already, always been in wildlife, biodiversity, evolution. And as I myself was uh, uh, studying evolution when I came abroad for my master's program, one thing that fascinated me was Darwin's theory, obviously. Um, you, you see in this picture, like uh, Darwin's theory has a lot of strengths. It's one of the key key theory that uh, explains um, why we are here in, in the planet today. But one thing that really caught my eye was the weakness. And when I saw this, like this statement that said Darwin didn't know about the genes, and that really excited me. Well, let's say so. I thought that perhaps this is something that I should continue and maybe continue what. Darwin didn't know about. So let's go back to Darwin's theory and try to use these new genomic techniques uh, to basically continue what he was doing back uh, back then. And I think I don't need to explain you much about uh, Darwin's uh, Darwin's work. Uh, as you all know, like it was back in 1830s that uh, a young Charles Darwin was traveling all over the world, and then he arrived to this famous island called Galapagos in South America. Uh, and uh, when he was in that island, he was fascinated by uh, looking at certain kind of uh, birds, the finches. And these birds in Galapagos, the, what we call Darwin's finch today, have become the foundation for his amazing theory of uh, natural selection and his book, Origin of Species, that explained uh, evolution. So, uh, so what is the most interesting thing about this, uh, these birds, the finches, that even Charles Darwin was excited about was their beaks. So, you know, there are many different species of these birds in the island. They all look very similar in terms of morphology or physiology or the ecology. But the only major difference in these birds are their beaks. And these beaks are very advanced and very adaptive. So uh, every species on that island is adapted to a type of food. So some, some birds are insect eaters, some are seed eaters, some are vegetarian, some are omnivorous, so there are like uh, different types of species. Each have a unique type of beak. So basically these birds, what they do, the Darwin's finches, they use this, uh, these beaks as a toolbox. And these beaks are adapted to the type of food they're eating in, in, in the specific island in Galapagos. So to understand about the evolution of these birds and to understand about the Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, one key thing was, was to understand about the evolution of these beaks and that was my major target of my own research so uh, again i'm not going into too much details about my work because i have been working uh, with this project for more than 10 years now so what i, I can only say here is uh, what we are doing in this last 10 years is that every year year after year uh, we go to galapagos i go to galapagos so this is a galapagos is this small islands uh, um, about 500 miles away from mainland South America. 
and we have contacts with the local authorities there, the Galapagos National Park and the Galapagos Science Center. So we actively work with them. So when we go there, what we do mostly is we do extensive field research. We have a big team. Uh, we do a lot of field research and um, that will help us to collect samples. So we, in this last 10 years, what we are doing is we collect samples from all the species of these birds. So there are 18 different species of uh, Darwin's finches currently in Galapagos. And we try to collect many birds from all these species. And then what we do th after that is we just collect these samples, collect blood samples. We bring them back to the lab. And again, use all these different sequencing instruments. Uh, it could be Illumina, it could be PacBio, Oxford Nanopore, or whatever is available or whatever uh, depends on the need of the project. And we sequence the genomes of these birds. Uh, that's what we do. And then again, not being too technical. So what we do is uh, then when once we have the genomes of these different species, uh, we compare the genomes of species with different big types. So we can classify the birds with um, different big types. For example, we can say, hello, the bird is big, has a pointed beak or a blunt beak. Again, you can categorize them based on their beak shape, or you can even classify them based on a big size. You can say, okay, these birds have small beaks, these have medium beaks, and these have larger beaks. So you can simply classify the birds depending on their phenotype, in this case, beaks, and then we simply compare the genomes of uh, these birds uh, for our specific uh, hypothesis, for example. And again, uh, I will not be very technical here, but what we do mostly is, uh, so these are one of the most common types of plots that you will also see uh, during all your hands-on exercise from tomorrow. So we try to look into the genome. So what I'm showing in this plot is, uh, so every small dot in this plot is a specific mutation in the, in the genome. So we first identify mutations across the whole genome. So in this case, like uh, for this particular plot, I had identified about 40 million uh, mutations, SNPs uh, as we call them. And then once we identify these mutations, we compare uh, the amount of difference between these mutations in different species. And that's what I'm showing here. So on the y-axis, you see the amount of genetic difference. So higher the value, it means that that is the specific SNP that shows very strong difference between these two birds. And then each of this higher peak value that you are seeing here is the specific location in the genome and that is different uh, between, in, in this case, a bird with a larger beak and a bird with a smaller beak. So we do that uh, for each of our uh, comparisons. That's what we do. So that's the first step. Look at the entire genome, look at the SNP, and try to see where in the DNA, where in the genome uh, we see this strong difference. And of course, we do a lot of statistics to, uh, to control and to choose the, the uh, and to, to rule out the false positive signals. Again, this is all about looking at the signal. That's the first step. The second step then is then once we identify these uh, uh, DNA locations, we zoom into these regions and try to see the specific chromosomes in that particular region. So for example, in the plot you see in the bottom, so this is uh, just showing the chromosome of every individual. So every line is one individual. And you know, every individual has two chromosomes. So a two line is from one individual. So here you can see that for this particular location, all the birds that had red color chromosomes, most of them always had, for example, in this case, blonde type of beak. Whereas all the birds that were having a blue chromosome, in this case at the bottom, and they had pointed types of beaks. So you can clearly see that at least for this specific location of the genome, there is a clear difference in chromosome between a bird with a blunt beak and a bird with a pointed beaks. And for some of the birds, you can see yellow color. So with yellow color means heterozygous, which means that these birds carry one copy of blunt chromosome and one copy of pointed. Again, this is perhaps these are these were the carriers, for example, or heterozygous as we call in, in, in genetics. So again, this is a way to like really uh, pinpoint or to zoom in to try to find what are the specific genes uh, that uh, shows a major difference in phenotypes. So that's the second step to zoom in. And the third step then is to do a lot of statistical analysis because we want to actually make sure that specific genetic variation that we have identified is strongly associated with, uh, uh, with the phenotype. So in this case, what we do then we go back to the um, back to the field we collect more sample 
we collect more birds, we measure the, their beak uh, phenotype, we, we just measure the length and the breadth uh, of the beak, and then we just use some kind of statistics to uh, look at the look at the association. So again, I'm not going into too much details, but what we do is then you compare the variation in the genotype with the variation in the phenotype, which we call a classical uh, genome-wide association study. Again, you'll hear more about that in the technical sessions from tomorrow. And using that approach, you can identify which are the key genes that is associated with a particular phenotype. And in this case, like uh, we had identified a gene called ALX1, which was showing very strong association uh, that was uh, with the overall big diversity in Darwin's finches. So again, I'm not talking too much about my work here because I don't have time, but uh, these are the types of things we do. And uh, I must say that this project in this last 10 years has been very successful thanks to this exciting genomic techniques like we have identified genes for big shape, genes for big types. We have also identified like how climate change and the impact of uh, human activities is really impacting the Darwin's finches in Galapagos. What happened, what, how did these birds look like when they were uh, maybe 50 years ago? Because we have even samples from uh, very old, uh, old times and we can compare that with what's happening now. So we can clearly see the strong uh, genomic signals for um, climate change in, in happening in Galapagos. So, and, and we have, also found a lot of information about how uh, these birds are evolving and how speciation is happening. So it has given us a lot of uh, information and this has all resulted in some of the very good uh, journals. So we are lucky to uh, publish all these findings in uh, some of the top journals in the field, uh, um, particularly in nature and science. So this, this has been a super successful uh, project at, until this point. And, um, it's not just about the, the papers, but uh, you know, once you have these good papers, like you have this uh, big interest from international media and that tries to cover your work. And again, as a researcher, this is a fascinating thing that you really want your research to be known uh, as much as, uh, as wide as uh, across the world. So, and, and we have a lot of interest from big medias like BBC or National Geography or Washington Post, CNN that has, that has highlighted our work in the past so as, as a researcher it, uh, it, it, it is a very motivating thing and me being a, a Nepali so not just the, the international media is I have been leading this work there has been a lot of interest even from our own Nepalese media so our my work particularly has been highlighted multiple times uh, in Nepalese media mostly in Kantipur like they have been uh, really following the work and this is what I really think that's one thing that had changed in uh, in the Nepalese media because I would not think that perhaps 10 years ago uh, any Nepalese media would be really interested in scientific uh, uh, stories that they would publish because you know most of the time uh, our Nepal, our media is all, all just about politics but I was very happy that uh, Nepalese media these days are taking real interest in what we do and try to follow all of us as a Nepalese researcher abroad and so this was quite uh, quite good quite good uh, experience as well. So just to summarize what uh, what I can say at this point is that uh, again talking more about the theme of genomics, uh, the key aspect of why this project was this successful was the way we were able to just ask a very simple question. For example, Darwin's theory is nothing nothing new like everybody knows about Darwin's theory but we just used the very simple question in biology and Darwin's theory but then we were able to apply cutting edge genomic techniques like we were the first to use some of the tools right after they came into the came into the field so the core thing that was uh, behind the, the success of this project was all genomics uh, and the way we could integrate these genomic methods into the uh, into our respective uh, uh, question that we were asking so again i can't uh, explain more on like how important this genomics has been uh, in this project and uh, that's why we are all interested in genomics uh, these days. But then going ahead, when you think about biodiversity and when you think about uh, evolution, uh, it's not just the Darwin's finches or Galapagos uh, that uh, can explain this evolution. Like, you know, I mean, we, ha we all have our own study of uh, study system like somebody's working with plants somebody's working with animals insects whatever like and every species has their own 
evolutionary history and their own biodiversity. So we can directly use the same principles that was used in this project uh, into a completely different project. And then the connecting thing is again the same uh, genomics. And that's what we are highlighting in this uh, session today. And um, talking about biodiversity and evolution, like uh, we as an evolutionary biologist and animal scientist, we mostly tend to focus on what we call biodiversity hotspots. So, you know, when you see this global map, there are few biodiversity hotspots around the world which are very important field sites for doing this kind of study and if you look at our own uh, asian map you can see himalayas so himalayas has been considered as one of the very important and major biodiversity hotspot but as we all know compared to other hotspots across the world our own himalayas has been very very poorly studied again we know the reasons, but uh, yeah, so uh, I, I have been really been interested on this Himalayas uh, currently for my current project. But I think like we do have a lot of potential back home in the Himalayas to explore about the biodiversity and use, use uh, uh, genomics uh, techniques to study more about these, these systems back home in the Himalayas. So one of the fascinating thing for me when I think about Himalayas is that, uh, you know, we all agree with this that in a very limited geographical span, we see a very striking uh, a rise in elevation when you see the Himalayas. So think about Tarai, then you think about Churia and Mahabharat Lake, then we have low mountain hills, high mountain hills, uh, and then we have our very own Mount Everest, and then we have this uh, Tibetan plateau on the other side. So when you see this map, you can see that how in a very limited uh, geographical range, there is this very strong uh, rise in elevation. And then we have birds, for example, as I'm interested in studying birds. So we, we do have birds, different species of birds that are particularly adapted to a respective elevation. So um, there are specific birds that can only survive in a particular, uh, particular elevation. And there are some birds, for example, that can even fly over Mount Everest. So they are specially adapted to that one. So one of the ongoing projects that I have in the lab right now is we are really interested to understand the molecular basis, the genetic basis of how birds can adapt to these very different altitudes in the Himalayas. And that's one of the ongoing projects that we have. Uh, and um, I have a student, luckily he's also from Nepal. So he's a PhD fellow at Kent State University uh, who has been leading this work. Um, and so we have been doing that. And, uh, but uh, when you think about Himalayas, I think we all agree that uh, it's not just in Nepal, right? So uh, the Himalayas is spanning China, Nepal, and India. So uh, we have been building this project uh, as, a, as a large collaborative project where we can involve people from or universities from all these three countries uh, to come and work together um, on this particular project on high altitude adaptation. And the things are still ongoing. It's a very fairly new project, but we do already have very exciting collaborations. For example, like uh, I do already have some um, uh, collaborations from China. We have three different universities uh, that have already joined the team and we are working already together, uh, particularly in the Tibetan plateau side uh, uh, or, or the Northern Himalayas um, in, in this case. And so uh, the collaborations and, and the work with the Chinese team is already underway. Uh, we recently had a new collaborations with the, some Indian Research Institute as well. Uh, so we have teamed up with this uh, Institute uh, of uh, Himalayan Bioresource Technology. It's uh, one of the high altitude uh, uh, institute uh, in Palampur, India. So we have been doing a lot of collaborations with them. I'm guessing some of the, my collaborators from India are in this audience today as well. Uh, so yeah, we have been doing a lot of collaborations with, uh, with the Indian counterparts. And the third is obviously Nepal, and you can see my slide is empty. Uh, which means that at this point, I don't have any collaborations with Nepal. I think that that's the opportunity and that's why we are here today because that I'm, our lab is actively looking for collaborations in Nepal to do this kind of uh, genomic work uh, and uh, uh, use our expertise to explore more about uh, biodiversity in, in, in Nepal. So, but when we talk about, let's talk about uh, what, what can be done in Nepal. And I think one of the key challenges that we have uh, at least to do a genomic work in Nepal is we are severely lacking on the facilities. We don't have proper genomic facilities in Nepal. And that's one of the key difference that uh, uh, we have 
uh, compared to my other collaborators. For example, in China and in, in Nepal, uh, sorry, in India, they already have a very strong um, uh, genomic facilities. So doing, uh, for example, genome sequencing in China and India for me uh, is not a problem. They already have it. So, but when we think about these collaborative efforts that we want to build in Nepal, the first thing we have to do is to set up these genomic facilities. And uh, there are some things that we have already started to do. For example, recently our lab here in at Kent State has uh, joined hand with, with one of the uh, research facility in, in Kathmandu. It's called Center for Health and Disease Studies. So our lab was uh, uh, helping them to install some kind of uh, uh, genomic facilities there, uh, which has which will be used for uh, surveillance of uh, emerging disease and to study um, my own projects on biodiversity in Nepal. But this was this is again just a small example where we were able to contribute just a small a small scale uh, genomic facilities but to, uh, i think now now is the time to think big to, to think about a, a national scale a genomic facilities and i think for that uh, the universities should uh, come, come ahead and i think uh, and there is this is the right time you can collaborate with the with the universities in, in nepal and i think uh, giving a talk here at afu will open this door for us uh, to do this uh, big scale collaborations with the uh, Nepalese universities. And uh, we are always happy and open to provide our expertise and maybe like uh, even think about sharing funds uh, to develop this kind of uh, genomic facilities in Nepal. And again, uh, we are very looking forward to this kind of collaborations, um, both me as a person and also as my own uh, university here. Uh, in the USA, so that's that. That's that, and uh, it's not just about uh, collaborations. Like uh, as I said, like I am currently a, a professor at Kent State, and my lab is very new. I just started this position last year, so it's not just I'm only looking for collaborations. I'm also looking for students. So if anybody here in the audience uh, thinks that uh, they are interested in the type of work I'm doing, or like they think they have, they want to learn about genomics. So I have a lot of positions. I'm looking for master's student, PhD students, postdoctoral fellows. I also need some research technicians to work in my lab. So again, there we do have a lot of job openings available in my lab. So if anybody thinks that uh, they might be a good fit, uh, they can write to me. My email is uh, uh, in this slide. And yeah, we can happy to talk more. So yeah, looking for students, looking for collaborations, and that's why I'm here today. By saying that, I would like to finish my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Lamchani, for the wonderful talk. I do hope that uh, folks in Nepal will be uh, willing to uh, collaborate with him and other researchers that are doing several projects in the US so that we can advance the uh, situation of genomics uh, in Nepal. And uh, I do want to uh, remind all of you, if you have any questions, please put them on the uh, chat box in Zoom. We'll be doing a question answer session at the end of the uh, seminar. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Uh, Radhika Bartola, who is a postdoctoral associate at USDA ARS, to talk about her uh, slide, which is titled Application of Bioinformatics in Plant Science. Dr. Bartola, the floor is yours. You are muted. Yeah, go ahead, please share. Yeah, I can see your screen. All good? Yep, perfect. Um, thank you, Dr. Podil. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, thank the organizer and all the participants for um, making this um, program um, happen. So before um, I start, sorry. Before I start, um, I want all of you to imagine a day in future, in 2050. All you see is a lot of human beings and so little food. What will we do then? Um, well, today I'm going to share some cutting edge science, uh, such as genomics and bioinformatics, 
that can help um, drop improvement to avoid such nightmare in future. Uh, my name is Radhika Bertola, and um, and um, like other speakers and organizers, I'm also a proud alumni of uh, Rampur campus. I graduated with BSc Agriculture in 2011, and I briefly worked as a student worker at uh, NARC under Dr. Dhruva Bahadur Thapa in wheat breeding program uh, until I joined a PhD program in genetics um, at the University of New Hampshire. So I graduated um, uh, with a PhD in genetics in 2018, and now I'm working as a postdoc at um, uh, uh, serial disease lab, U United States Department of Agriculture at University of Minnesota. Um, so let's begin by talking what are the challenges of global food security? Well, there are many challenges um, uh, or many factors that lead to global food security. The one we know is we human. World population is rising. Um, human population is expected to reach 9 billion by 2050. With this increasing population, global demand for food is rising. That means we need to double the food production to feed all the hungry mouth. Um, and climate change is real. Climate change could put millions of people back to poverty by destroying farming. So the picture like this, uh, which was taken in Iran in 2000, um, uh, 16 is not uncommon to all of Nepalese. We see a lot of our crops being flooded every year during the time of harvest, again, um, providing a challenge to global food security. Plant diseases, on the other hand, have always been uh, a problem uh, in human history. One of the greatest examples uh, of the plant disease was uh, the great Irish famine that was caused by a late blight of potato uh, in Ireland. So uh, due to this uh, late by disease in potato, um, all the potato crops uh, failed during 1845, 1846, and 1848. During that time, one million people died, and nearly one people, one million people migrated. Um, another worst um, enemy for the glo global food security is the insect pest. We all have heard about this um, desert locust that have destroyed millions of hectares of land in um, Africa and in India, and now it has entered Nepal. So this was just the headline that I was seeing in the Kathmandu Post on July 9th. Eight million locusts have entered Nepal, consuming hundreds of hectares of crops. It's scary enough with the situation of um, COVID. Now, all the headlines are surging with the hunger pandemic, but one of the worst fear the pandemic like COVID-19 can bring is food insecurity. It is believed um, that uh, the number of people at risk of starvation today is 135 million. And by the end of 2020, due to COVID, um, 260 might, 265 million people might starve. So there are a lot of challenges for food security and to overcome all the challenges and to produce enough food to feed all the hungry mouths by 2050, we need to um, either improve the crops we have now or breed new crops in the short period of time. So how do we do that? Um, well, that goal is very challenging because modern crops are the results of thousands of years of selection over years for desired traits. Oftentimes, the modern crops that uh, we see now are unrecognizable from their ancestors. For example, this is the modern uh, domesticated carrot we see now, but this is the ancestor. It just looks like a root of some random crops and inedible. Similarly, um, for a long time, scientists um, have difficulty finding what actually was the ancestor of the modern maize that we see. Nothing in the wild look um, similar to the maize. Um, it took a lot of work for the scientists, um, for the research geneticists, biologists, and archaeologists to actually find out that the modern 
crop we see now was um, evolved from this plant called Teosinte, which doesn't look anything like maize. Um, so um, from the time that this uh, first maize appeared in about 7,000 years ago from Teosinte via bu uh, mutation events, it took really, it was only until 1947 that we had this hybrid um, maze that we know of, which is high yielding. So literally it can take thousands of years to domesticate a crop and to improve um, the crop varieties. So how do we achieve this? How do we um, accelerate the, uh, the breeding to improve the crop to feed billions of people in short period of time? So um, the basics for all the breeding is we need to learn about the genetics of all these crops. Um, before I go into detail about genomics, so let me back up a little bit. Uh, you have seen these kind of slides with um, previous speakers too, uh, but the DNA is fundamental of our life. We are what we are coded in the DNA. The DNA is transcribed into RNA, RNA is translated into protein, and this protein via biochemical process will re result in particular phenotype. For example, here, this apple, strawberry, um, and pear, they are from the same family, but it's the genetic code that's going to decide either it's gonna be apple, um, strawberry, or pear. Um, now, the genetic variation that occurs or that are present in the DNA are the basis for all the plant breeding and crop improvement. We select those genetic variation that will lead to new or improved crops. A classical example is, uh, can be shown from this uh, mustard family, uh, how selection of a particular phenotype or genotype will lead to a new crop. Um, from this one wild mustard, selection of the flower clusters led to um, production of cloudy flower, selection of broccoli, uh, selection of the stems and flowers led to the production of broccoli, selection to the, uh, the flower terminal board led to cabbage and so on. However, the traditional selection based on the phenotype is painfully slow. It takes thousands of years as I have um, shown previously in the, in the case of maize. So how do we relate? Uh, the genetic variation that are present in these plants with the phenotype so that we can select the desired um, traits for crop improvement um, within a short period of time. That's where the uh, genomics and bioinformatics comes into play. So um, what exactly is genomics? Genomics is the analysis of um, organisms' complete DNA sequence. You saw this uh, figure in um, Dr. Lamitani and um, Dr. Um, Acharya's slide. So it's just the analysis of all the DNA sequences of an organism. And again, like uh, the previous speakers had said, bioinformatics is an interrelated science that involves biology, computer science, and other related fields that develops computational software and methods to actually interpret the large data sets that we produce from the genomic data to understand the biological process. Um, as um, Dr. Lamisani mentioned um, in his um, talk, uh, with the advent of next generation sequencing techniques and reduction in the cost for sequencing and genotyping, many model plants and uh, model and non-model plant genome has been sequenced. Um, the genome sequence is fundamentally important to understand uh, and identify the key genes controlling agronomic traits. They are also important to identify the genetic variability that occurs among the plant cultivars. They're also important to understand the functions of the individual genes, and also to reveal previously unknown regulatory mechanism that coordinates the activities of genes. They're also 
fundamentally important to understand the evolutionary relationship and crop domestication. Now, plant genomes are really complex to assemble. Uh, many of the uh, plants, as you see in this graph, um, have large genome size. For example, if you compare the genome size for COVID-19, it's only 30 kilobase pair. Human um, has only 3.3 gigabase of the, uh, the genome, but wheat has 17 gigabase of, of the genome size. Plants also vary in their ploidy labels. Some of them are diploid to polyploid, meaning that some of the plants have um, two sets of chromosomes while others have multiple. Uh, we, human, are diploid. We have two sets of chromosomes, one coming from our father and one coming from our mother. Um, in the other hand, wheat is hexaploid. That means it has six copies of same sets of chromosomes. Plant also consists of large sets of repetitive elements, meaning that a lot of the, uh, the DNA sequences are repeated in plants, which makes the genome assembly um, very hard. Despite that, um, because of the advent in next generation uh, sequencing techniques and reduction in the cost, um, major plants such as rice, um, maize, and wheat genome have been completely sequenced. Not only the major genes, major crops, but also the minor crops such as ladyfinger or finger millet or potato have been sequenced. Um, this graph shows the trend um, of, of the uh, genome sequencing project. Here in the x-axis is the number of year, and here are the, uh, on the y-axis is the number of the plant genome papers that have appeared. Again, uh, this is little outdated um, graph, so the data only goes up to 2014, but from uh, beginning from 2000, uh, more and more plant genome have been sequenced and the numbers keep going on. And these days, many and ma more plant genome um, are, are in the process of being sequenced. Um, here are some examples for those people who are interested in learning more about the genomics project in plants. Uh, so uh, these are the databases where you can find a lot of information Again, like Dr. Lamy Sani said, a lot of information, uh, not only about just the genomic data project, but also job openings, um, you know, what's happening, what's new uh, in this field. So I highly encourage you to visit this databases if you are interested in um, learning genomics or um, see yourself in future um, doing some of the genomics project. Um, so now let's talk, how exactly does this genomics and bioinformatics um, help in crop improvement? Well, the first thing uh, the genomics does is uh, develop thousands, thousands and thousands of molecular markers and construct high um, density linkage maps. Molecular markers, um, they arise from the differences in DNA sequence of the individual. Here, uh, you know, uh, you see these three individuals, they have the same genotypic code except this um, fourth base pair where you see there is a variation in the genetic code. Such variation is called SNPs. Most of the time, uh, individuals from same species have same genetic code, but now and then there is some genetic, um, uh, there is some variation that results in nucleotide polymorphism, and these can be a useful markers. So next generation sequencing actually helps to generate tens of thousands of molecular markers by comparing the DNA sequences uh, of the individuals. This DNA sequence now, then, now can be used to construct a genetic map. A genetic map is nothing but an ordered list of those molecular markers or genes along the chromosome. For example, this is a genetic map for the Arabidopsis thaliana which is uh, a model crop for um, plant species. So Arabidopsis thaliana have five chromosomes. And here you can see the markers are systematically arranged in a list in all the chromosomes. 
now at this point you have identified what are the genetic variants that occur on those individuals and you have arranged them systematically in the chromosome that means you know where the gene or where the molecular markers lies in the chromosome now the next step is to link the genotype with the phenotype and the techniques such as QTBL mapping and genome-wide association studies um, links the genotype to the phenotype. At this point, um, what you are doing is you are using a statistical software and asking, are any of those molecular markers that are arranged here systematically in the chromosomes associated with the traits of interest? For example, here, so the traits we are interested in is in the green link. So we are asking, are any of those molecular markers arranged in the chromosomes associated with the green length? And here, this is a typical QTL graph. And what it is saying is, yes, indeed, the markers that are present in the chromosome three is associated that you can see with this large score, the high peak uh, with the green length. Similarly, genome-wide association study is also and other um, technical methods where you can associate genotype with the phenotype. The plot you are seeing here is called a Manhattan plot, a typical plot from the genome-wide association studies. So here, again, what you are asking is, you are asking if the molecular markers that are arranged systematically in the chromosome of rice is associated with this disease called the, sorry, um, uh, associated with this disease called Bacani. And again here, as you can see with this strong um, log value here, yes, indeed some of the markers in um, chromosome one and some of the markers in chromosome four are associated with um, the Bacani disease, um, disease. So at this point, so you identified the genetic variants present in the uh, plant population. You also identified their phenotypic traits. And now with the help of these mapping uh, techniques, you were able to associate genotypes with the phenotypes. Now what you can do is uh, for the crop improvement, you can select those individuals that have this particular genetic variants um, to improve crops. So this will shorten your time uh, significantly. Instead of just selecting the phenotype, just selecting the crops based on phenotype, if you select the crops based on the genotype, um, you shorten the time um, for crop improvement. Now, let me tell you a story. In 1969, a famous um, professor from Stanford uh, published a book called The uh, Population Bond in which he predicted that famines, especially in India, would kill hundreds of millions of people in 1970s and 1980s. And he wrote in the cover page, while you're reading these words, poor people will have died from starvation, most of them children. Luckily, and thanks to the work of this one man, which many of us may know, uh, and only uh, one Nobel Prize winner in the field of agriculture, Dr. Norman Borlaug, and his Green Revolution, the um, global agriculture transform. In 19, from 1960s to 1980s, yield of rice and wheat in Asia doubled through selective breeding. Although population growth was more than 60%, uh, instead of famine, the poverty actually reduced by uh, 50% because of the Green Revolution. Now, um, to do the same thing in between now and 2050 to feed all the hungry mass, we need a second Green Revolution. That's what um, the genomics and bioinformatics will enable by um, enhancing or refueling the um, old technologies to fight the hunger. Uh, 3000 Rice Genome Project is one of such examples. Um, I think you will hear more about this project tomorrow uh, when you uh, hear Dr. Powell and Dr. Parajuli's talk tomorrow. Um, so what this project is doing is there are uh, all the scientists from all over the world are, are gathered together to sequence um, all the rice um, cultivars, both domesticated and wild, 
to study the genetic variants to find if those variants are related to the traits. Uh, there are multiple traits here. Uh, I'm not going to go in detail. Maybe you'll learn um, more tomorrow. To if you know some of the, the genetic variants that are present in those rice can be related to uh, create green super rice. Um, so um, actually, in order to do this genomic breeding, the first thing you need to know is to find the genes that the super genes that can relate um, to those um, genes so that we can breed. And that's what the genomics and bioinformatics will enable. It will enable us to find in a short period of time how these genetic variants that are present in these 3,000 rice genomes relates to the traits that we are interested in to breed super green rice. Um, another technique, um, um, genetic engineering is another one that's going to fuel um, the crop improvement to feed all the hungry mouths. Um, basically, there are two kinds of genetic engineering, transgenes, um, which we have heard as GMOs. So this is a technique in which a foreign gene is inserted into the, uh, the DNA strain. One of the famous ones that um, many of us know is Bt corn or the Bt um, soybean and Bt cotton. So what um, scientists did was they isolated this Bt gene uh, from a bacteria called the Bacillus thuringiensis and inserted into a maize crop. Uh, when uh, warm, this corn borer eats this uh, transgenic plants. The Bt protein is going to crystallize in the uh, gut of this worm, and the insect is going to die, um, hence preventing the corn crops or the Bt crops from um, getting uh, affected or getting being eaten by by the insects. Another technique um, is uh, gene editing, mostly enabled through a technique such as CRISPR-Cas9, um, zinc uh, finger, and talons. So uh, instead of inserting the foreign DNA, uh, what this gene editing allows, is, allows you to do is to actually cut the gene and modify the DNA. So this is like a copy and paste while well, this is like a cut and paste function. So you cut the gene and you modify the DNA. Um, so in traditional breeding, most of the, um, the breeders depend on the natural variation that have been created through natural mutation. And they're very limited. And oftentimes um, the genes that um, governs the, the traits of interest are unknown. So in that case, that's where this gene editing actually really helps. So gene editing actually will, create, uh, will edit the DNA to create a desired alternation in the genes, the, the desired alternation, the desired variation that we want, and uh, it will create a variation in the gene pool. And as I said earlier, once there is a variation, we can actually select those variations for um, the, the traits of interest and um, we can actually breed a crop just like uh, traditional breeding. Um, so this figure actually shows uh, how many uh, crops have been, uh, uh, this figure shows how um, CRISPR-Cas9 have been used in this um, agriculture crops. To date, there are many uh, agriculture crops in which uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system has been successfully applied to modify the genes. And these are the numbers of genes um, actually that have been modified um, um, using the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, system. So um, this um, uh, gene editing system will actually accelerate the crop uh, breeding by creating the genetic variation that we desired rather than um, relying on the natural variation that we uh, see um, in very less frequency. Now, 
to give a brief snapshot of how I have used um, bioinformatics and genomics in my own research program. Uh, I work with a plant disease called a stem rust. Um, so this is caused by a fungal pathogen, Coccinia graminis. Um, it mainly infects uh, cereal crops, uh, mostly wheat, but also infects um, uh, cereal crops like barley, um, oat, and um, dry. So this uh, disease is prevalent throughout the world wherever uh, uh, wheat is grown. And uh, this disease uh, is actually one of the um, most uh, feared disease, plant diseases by human because it can cause 100% yield loss um, in case of severe epidemics. And in past, um, because of uh, stem rust, there have been severe epidemics um, resulting in food insecurity uh, over the centuries. But this pathogen that causes the stem rust disease is actually very smart. It not only infects um, cereal crops, but it goes to completely unrelated plant um, called a barberry um, to complete the sexual cycle. I encourage you to watch this YouTube video if you wanted to learn more about uh, the stem rust and uh, its life cycle. So my um, PhD research focus was on this barberry trying to find uh, stem rust resistant genes. Now, like with all the system, um, so now with, now like with all the genetic um, studies, the first thing you need to find is uh, the variation um, in the traits. So luckily within this barberry system, there are some species that in which all the individuals are susceptible to stem rust. There are some individuals that are um, in which all the individuals are resistant to uh, stem rust. And interestingly, these um, two species hybridize to um, create interspecific hybrids. So, now we can use this interspecific hybrid to um, actually um, understand the question of how or why this um, species is resistant to stem rust. So to understand that, I created a, a biparental mapping population by crossing these two species and generated 182 F1 hybrids. Now, um, I wanted to know if these uh, 182 uh, F1 progenies um, are, um, uh, or if they vary for the uh, stem rust disease as their parents do. And indeed, some of the um, hybrids look just like the resistant parents and some of the hybrids look like um, the uh, susceptible parents. So now the next thing uh, that I did was uh, to find what are the genetic variants that occurred um, in those hybrid individuals? And to do that, I um, did um, the DNA extraction from all the 182 progeny and the parental species and did a sequencing on Illumina platform. Um, then I then compared the genomic sequence of all the uh, 182 hybrid progeny and their parental species. And using the bioinformatics pipeline, I identified um, 23,000 uh, molecular markers. I then mapped those molecular markers into the genetic map. Um, so Barberry has 14 chromosomes and I uh, ordered these uh, 23,000 markers um, into each chromosomes in a systematic order. Now, uh, to relate um, the, uh, the stem rust resistance um, with the molecular markers that I have identified, uh, I conducted a QTL analysis, um, and the QTL analysis led uh, to identification of a single um, QTL with a large effect in the chromosome number uh, three of the resistant parents, which relates to this region in the um, genetic map. Now, simply looking, it looks like this is a very small region, um, and uh, we should be able to find a gene easily. However, if we look into uh, depth of, of, of these regions and look into the DNA sequence, this sequence actually consists millions and millions of base pair of uh, nucleotide. So how do we find um, 
which genes actually relates to the stem rust resistance in this region. Now, to do that, um, I uh, sequenced uh, uh, resistant parents using this PAC bio uh, sequencing uh, technique and assemble the genome to help annotate um, the uh, reason I also extracted the RNA and um, sequence the uh, RNA and assemble the transcriptome. Now with the help of the QTL map, genome assembly and transcriptome assembly, I was able to relate this region to, um, to the physical map. And um, I was able to find a total of 99 genes uh, in these regions. Now to find out uh, which genes of those uh, 99 were associated with stem rust, I performed uh, analysis called uh, differential gene expression analysis and find five candidate genes. Um, validation of these genes um, and uh, further work is underway. Uh, currently, as a postdoc at Serial Digital Lab, um, I am working to understand how um, stem rust pathogen evolved in a first place. So in recent days, we have been seeing um, many stem rust outbreaks around the world, especially in um, East Africa and in Europe, um, causing um, epidemics. So pathogens are evolving so fast. Um, breeders do not know what to do. The resistant genes that have been deployed um, have been um, broken down rapidly because of this evolving pathogen. So I'm trying to understand um, how or this stem rust pathogen evolved in the first place. And like um, Dr. Lamy Sane mentioned, there are a few mechanisms how evolution can occur. One is a random mutation, and uh, this random mutation gets selected uh, and um, a new pathogen evolves. Second is a somatic hybridization, relatively new uh, in the stem rust pathogen world, in which um, two uh, stem rust pathogen fuses without sexual recombination uh, to give um, and exchange their genetic materials uh, to give uh, rise to new pathogen. And the third is the sexual recombination, and that's what I'm working on. And just to, again, uh, remind you back, wheat stem rust pathogen is very smart. During the wheat growing season, it actually uh, draws all the nutrients uh, from wheat and multiplies in number. But as the plant goes dormant, um, wheat stem rust pathogen also becomes dormant and uh, during the favorable time they germinate and instead of uh, infecting wheat crop they actually will go to this completely unrelated plant called barberry um, in which uh, i was working during my phd project so because the sexual um, uh, recombination is happening in the stage so uh, the question that i'm trying to understand is are all these um, um, stem rust that come out of the barberry are new races and if they're new races are they the new virulent races and so to do that again i'm using the help of the bioinformatics and um, genomics to understand this complex question um, finally to summarize um, for all crop improvement we always start with the the uh, phenotype so we go into and look into the uh, natural variation uh, or, and, and that we can look into the germplasm, land races, and uh, into wild relatives, then we find what are the genetic variants that uh, each of these individual plants have. And then by the uh, use of statistical techniques such as QGL mapping and GWAS, we identify what um, variants uh, are associated with those particular traits that we are interested in and by either direct sequencing or looking at the genomes from all the relatives and also by doing the differential gene expression we find the candidate genes after finding these candidate genes there are many things that we could do such as uh, transgenics or crispr cas9 um, and we can use this technique to select the variants um, with the desired traits to improve uh, seed crops. So in short, uh, while the conventional breeding or natural domestication took thousands and thousands of years to produce a modern crop, uh, with the help of genomics and bioinformatics, uh, we can improve crop over a short period of time. 
um, with that, that's all I have for now. So I'll be happy to um, take any questions at Q&A six and at the end. Thank you. So. Thank you, Dr. Bartola, for the wonderful talk on application of uh, bioinformatics into plants. So today we already listened uh, from speakers talking about uh, application of genomics in plants as well as animals and evolutionary studies. And now comes one of the most important uh, part of our seminar, which is uh, the application of uh, bioinformatics in medicine. And today we have uh, Mr. Sisir Subedi, who is a bioinformatician at Houston Methodist Hospital, who will be talking, uh, talking about the application of bioinformatics in medicine. So Sisir, the floor is yours now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bono. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, respected faculty members and the organizing team for this excellent opportunity. And also thanks for everyone for tuning in here. Hello, my name is Sishir Subedi, and I think I have to share my slide. Is it sorry? Not yet, go ahead and share it. How about now? Uh, still, I cannot see your screen. Let me try okay. Yes, I can see it. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, hello everyone again. My name is Sishir Subedi, and I did my bachelor's in molecular biology from Texas Tech University. And I was a researcher for a couple of years in Washington University in St. Louis and briefly in Baylor College of Medicine. And during this time, I was involved in molecular biology and biomedical research. And I got really excited into bioinformatics. And I took a little bit technical route uh, and went ahead and did my post back in computer science from University of Houston. And then later did my master's in computer science again in Texas State and in University. And where my focus was more in bioinformatics. And for the past couple of years, I'm working as a molecular bioinformatician in Houston Methodist Hospital here in Houston, Texas. So briefly today, I'll, uh, I'll talk about the different areas of medicine. It's vast, but I'll focus on preventive medicine, personalized medicine, diagnostic, vaccine development, drug development, a little bit on forensic. And so how different uh, in these areas, role of bioinformatics are present. And then I'll take a clinical diagnostic laboratory perspective because I come from that background and kind of so how different areas of bioinformatics like computer science and statistics and biology are interconnected and work together. And finally, I will uh, briefly talk about bioinformatics opportunities in Nepal. So since we are in this middle of this pandemic and we're talking about medicine, I think I have to uh, talk about this COVID-19 RT-PCR, which is uh, very co common among us. And so to warm up, I want to describe how actually this works. So if you have some kind of symptoms or you want to get tested, then we'll have this narrow nasopharyngeal swab, which contains a lot of human cells and other microorganisms. And one of them will be coronavirus, which is single-stranded RNA virus. So you extract RNA only, get rid of everything else. So RNA at this level is very low and we will not be able to detect it. So we need to apply this technique called reverse transcription, uh, which converts RNA into cDNA. And then we apply PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which amplifies this, this DNA in each cycle, it doubles it. And then we can use fluorescent probes to measure the amount of DNA. And if the pres virus is present at different levels, we see the signal here, and if it crosses threshold, then it's positive. If it's not, then it's negative. Right. So uh, following the same line, vaccine development is uh, in traditionally, when you have cases like infectious disease or in other, other, other diseases, where you have this sequence information of a level, usually from multiple isolates, then you do a comparative analysis uh, of all the sequences from host and viral genomes. And basically the idea is we're trying to find these viral targets. And these viral targets are highly polymorphic and they are, they are able to, hope is that they are able to induce uh, immune reactions in, in host cells. And once we kind of have the uh, 
uh, these targets, we hypothesize, then we clone this in uh, plasmids and then express them, test them, test it in test animals like mouse, and then see for antiviral activity. And if everything goes well with the vaccine uh, optimization, then we test for the test in humans. That's for the traditional approach. And there is now uh, the shortcut approach where we can repurpose old vaccines that have been proven to be effective. Uh, like in coronavirus, they are trying uh, the spike protein in old common cold virus, adenovirus, and they just take this spike protein uh, nucleotide and jump into the uh, adenovirus and then express test in humans to see if there is any antiviral activity in humans. That's the traditional workflow. And there, um, there's another uh, parallel approach where there's a reverse vaccine design. And there are many ways of doing this. And briefly, one way is that when you have COVID and you are uh, stay for 14 days or so, and then you get well, and then you, it means that you develop antibody against virus, right? And now what you can do is that all these antigen specific B cells, the, the memory cells, and these plasma cells which produce these antibodies, you can do a sequencing specifically, you try to find antigen specific antibody repertoire, and you use the uh, all sequence analysis and bioinformatics analysis plus a structural analysis to kind of come up with a, a potential vaccine candidate antigens predicting, uh, for the prediction. And then whichever is your top hit, you can again test in, test in human. Right? So these are the basic ways of vaccine development and bioinformatics are heavily used in these areas. So timeline, uh, everybody's interested, when are we going to get this COVID coronavirus vaccine? So if you see this timeline, you know, like you have discovery and manufacturing that takes from three to eight years. And then you have phase one, phase two, phase three trials from two to 10 years, and then one to two years in regulatory reviews and uh, government uh, policies and all that. So normally it takes, and in the best case scenario, you'll have five years or around three to five years is your best bet. But because of this uh, emergency, there are, there are the human trial uh, for coronavirus just started just before six months of first genome sequence. And currently there are about, 40, about 41 different approaches. And most of them are protein subunit. And some are RNA, some are inactivated uh, or the weakened viruses. And uh, if you can see here that a couple of the repurposing viruses uh, for, uh, for TB, like BCG vaccines, those are, uh, those are in phase two and phase three. And the one that's pretty uh, nowadays on news is the, uh, from Oxford, which is a adenovirus, which uses mRNA of spike proteins in lipid nanoparticles. So those are also uh, showing some good promises. And uh, so, but we have to be cautious here because uh, what is the, this is less than 10% of drug trials are ultimately approved. So even if we have in phase two and phase three, we, have, we can see here that 37% failures failed in phase one and then 69 in phase two and then about 42 in phase three. So we have to be very cautiously optimistic about uh, vaccine development and general consensus is that by the end of this year, we'll have uh, at least more than one uh, uh, therapeutics in combination of therapeutic solutions for the COVID. So the next area of medicine is along the same line is drug development. So in for vaccine development, we were only focusing on this immune and antigen presentation and this receptor and immune profiling, right? So now for drug development, we, we focus on specific disease, disease and what are the different genes that are, those are involved in this disease. And you take very high throughput holistic approach here, right from genomics, whole genome sequencing, trans transcriptome, ribosome profiling, proteomics, RNA structure and protein structures and genomic architecture. And you use bioinformatics tools in every one of these steps. And main idea is to you have the library of co compounds here and you want to reduce your bench work and you want to be more efficient and do most of the things in, in silico to, and hopefully you can come up with this final one compound target that works for, for the drug development purposes. And next is the preventive medicine, which is more like maintaining health. You don't have any disease, you're doing well, right? But right, maybe you can start from right from the day of your birth or whenever you feel like and, you, know, you want to get more information about your health. Then, and the reason behind is that a lot of uh, diseases, if you, uh, find it before it starts or like in cancer case in this 
uh, five-year survival chart. If you find a lot of those cancers uh, in stage one or pre stage, then you have almost 100% chance of curing it. While if you find it later on, on three years or four years, then it's really difficult for to find a cure unless you just maybe have some treatment which will elongate your survivability, but eventually those are very hard uh, cases. So basic idea is that why not we have this biomedical profile of, of someone, right? So you have your genomic information, you have your cellular and tissue information and other patient information, like if your family, your parents have heart attack or if you have breast cancer, then you, all this information. And on another part, you have this biomedical knowledge base from uh, years of research and, uh, and clinical side and both biomedical side, then you can combine this information and, and have a, like a monitoring system where you have biomedical, depending on if you're if you more likely to have heart attack, then you can be very cautious right from your 15 years of age or 20 years of age, whichever you feel comfortable, right? So that's that's where is main idea is to you live healthy life and you prevent medicine and hopefully, you know, in uh, further down the road, it's less expensive and less pain, pain, painful for all of us. And next in the, the personalized medicine, this is once you already have disease, right? So now how to treat them? So classical approach is that, okay, you have some certain symptoms, then there are certain, it's just like formula, you have these, these are symptoms, then you take these drugs, and then that's it well, from the medical side. But we, we know that like some drug just doesn't work. And that's why you have to go to different hospitals, different doctors and try, okay, this hospital not good, this doctor is not good. Right? So that's the, that's the main, across of it so then now what we can do in bioinformatics is that we have starting to get this all this genetic information all this laboratory information and now we can kind of take personalized medicine approach you, you, we see that there's a pharma genomics right so if you have uh, some depending on your genome you just some drugs doesn't work to, for you and some may work right so you can now build this different ports within uh, disease population and then you can uh, have a certain therapeutic uh, treatment and hopefully net a, a positive effect in all the you know, during treatment of various diseases. And the very interesting one is forensic medicine and which is just to narrow crime sub suspects. So we can build the genetic information now and we can sequence all the criminal database or even all have the suspect database and usually and have the police department or more law and judicial part there. And we, will, we can also have fingerprint database and we can use this genetic information just from sequence. We can uh, learn all the structures and do prediction modeling and biomimetics analysis to come up with, okay, you may look like this or maybe narrow down, okay, you may be among these people uh, group and then you can focus on that or you can just focus, narrow it down on ethnicity, right? Or yeah, or sex or different, different ways. And similarly, fingerprint also the same same idea here. So with all these different areas of medicine, diagnostic medicine is at the center of all. Right? We talk about preventive medicine, genetic screening, or in technological in metabolics, ge genomics, disease discovery, or drug or pharmaceutical. And in bioinformatics, a molecular diagnostic bioinformatics is very uh, plays a crucial role. So it deserves for us to a little bit dig into a little bit detail here. So from diagnostic perspective, uh, there are this interdisciplinary field that we call bioinformatics. It's just a combination of the computer science and biology and statistics. And in the main essence is that you have biological data and now we have this uh, large amount of data and how to analyze this, right? So we need to take help of some other disciplines. So what computer science can do here is it will help us to organize this data, how we query it, how to access certain specific information, right? That, that computer science will take care of it. Now we have statistics. So these are complex data from complex sources, right? We have discussed this uh, a lot um, this morning here. So then we need also complex uh, statistics methodologies to come up with results. And then finally, we need biology. You know, you can come up with results, but what's its use if you can't implement it or can't uh, add it to your knowledge base and use it? So then utilization comes from genetic testing and diagnostics, right? So we have all these three areas. So from computer science, it's briefly discuss, discuss what, uh, uh, how we can, how it's, how we can help us as in the bioinformatics area. So one is the data systems and management. So when you set up molecular diagnostic lab, you have to worry about these instruments because you are not only using one instrument, but combination of instruments, you have data 
generation from one side, and then you have to transfer those information to another side. So that's one part. And the second is server administration. It's still because of patient privacy and all this information, you don't want to get hacked, right? So it's still cloud computing is a little bit um, tricky and still, I think we are about five years behind. Uh, and we still, all these molecular labs and hospitals are still maintaining uh, server administration. And I think even if we go to cloud, still it will be like something, some form of in-house uh, cloud rather than you have everything in Amazon or Google somewhere sitting all over the world and you get hacked and all people will find out, you know, you have this disease and you are taking this, this medication. That's really risky for even hospital administration to go that route, right? So you have to have this server, server as an administration part and in bioinformatics as working as a bioinformatics a medicine, even if it's very technical, we do have to deal with cases uh, of uh, where we have to maintain the servers with admission uh, approvals and who to give access and whatnot and all setting up computation uh, resources. And then third one is integration. So these are just in-house, we can build results, come up with results, but you ultimately want to integrate with some external third party, maybe third party also in hospital systems like laboratory information systems or hospital information system where patient can access and now does even patient want to relate different uh, apps like 23andMe, Ancestry.com, or different apps where they can, they want to access the data directly. So there's an integration part. So if you look at the use case one, where you just want to set up a system in molecular diagnostic lab uh, for reporting testing results, right? And basically this is complicated, we can make it simple by just focusing on four modules. So when you have laboratory bench work done, you run sequencing, then you need something of user interface like web applications or desktop applications where you can input your results, start your assay, monitor it's, whether it's done or not, and then get your results and analyze those, right? Those are user interface. Then you need some kind of request module like in cluster or some cloud setting, wherever. So you, that, will, uh, that will take those, all those command and decide whether I want to do run this assay every day or every hour, or even some case every other minute, you know, that. And the other part is the computation part is which which actually the computer at the analysis are performed and there is a separate storage part and this is important because you don't want to have storage a module uh, intermingled around you know computation part because if computation fails it's fine you nothing is like you just replace it with another computer or something but if it stores and you were all the all the patient record it fails and then you are losing a lot of information and you are in big trouble so you really want to have it really secured, really robust system uh, with all backup system there. So you have to focus on the storage module a lot also. So here are a couple of uh, public available resources to setting, setting up a system uh, from system, uh, uh, system perspective, web application, all, this, all of these are freely available. And also there are some databases where we can especially uh, in cancer and other germline settings and also human genetic variation. There's, uh, yeah, so Nomad is this one is really big. It's maintained by MIT and it has almost uh, 125,000 exomes from 15,000 15, genomes. So this is really used a lot and it's freely available. So now let's move to statistics. So you have this clinical data, structure, unstructured, all nodes, different data. Now you want to organize this first in a structure form. Just think like the Excel where rows are different patients and columns are. Uh, you know, like demographic information or results for different tests, and maybe some columns will be your outcomes, like some people survived or didn't survive, uh, they had a heart attack, didn't have a heart attack, and all those kind of stuff. Now you can use this uh, nice structured data and use your statistics to do simple things, such as reporting. Okay, I had, we have lung cancer patient, how many of them are stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, right? Or you can be more really technical and get into all these algorithms of the statistics methodologies and do machine learning and artificial intelligence, right? So that's, that, that's the different aspect of the data analytics where statistics are really helpful. So one, one simple example, modeling of a long cancer patient survival using machine learning. So if you want to know you have a certain number of cancer patients and you want to know whether they are going to survive or not. If you think from the physician perspective, this is really important. Who, who, who do you want to more focus on? You know, if the, so you want to find out what's the survival for this patient. We have all this information, genetic information, all this uh, test information from different uh, genes and all that. So 
you can take this as a black box approach where you don't care how you, how the system decides okay just tell me what is the survivability is it 99% or it's like 50% tell me that that's a black box approach or you you really want to uh, do the interpret you know inter have the model to interpret your results right okay i'm saying this person is going to survive 75% because taste is this high taste is this low right so we can take these two different approaches and obviously in this one you have to use complex statistical models. Now you, you have a model, then how do you use in standard operating procedures? Right? So normally, uh, if your model is predicting really above 99%, then you can use it just like medical device, right? Like thermometer, yeah, it's doing good. Okay, survival, you measure it, 99% accuracy, you can just start using it. But most of the time, still we are way behind and still, especially biology is really complex and all these diseases and mechanisms are really in complex part and we just are not there yet where we have 99% accuracy. So in this case, what we can do is we can use it as, just, especially from there, no one will approve in hospital in clinical setting for uh, using this tool and because you have to answer how you decided this, right? So you can you just use that decision-making tool where you kind of just like other tests, you ran this model and it said 75% uh, survival or 50%, oh, maybe this, this is a serious case and you kind of understand why why this was, and depending on which model you use, you will know much better, right? So, and also on this one, some publicly, most of them are publicly available from machine learning, and from deep learning or visualization, and for easily for R language, you have domain specific libraries that you can use. So now finally the biological side, right? The genetic testing is uh, uh, basically medical tests that identify changes in chromosome. Now, where are those changes occur? Is it in germline, just like heart cell, then the, those are germline. Or then you have some lump in your uh, cancer and you want to test that and what, understand what changes are those, then it's somatic uh, uh, cases, right? And the types of changes, just a simple one, you have changes in chromosomes, the big large translocation inversion, copy number variation, insertion deletions, point mutations, usually the one that changes protein amino acids, and uh, epigenetics, uh, histone codes, and methylation test. So I just want to briefly give an uh, uh, just an idea of how this testing can be used. So one is the this personalized medicine is really cutting edge right now. Let's say you have a cancer patient and that comes and asks for treatment. And you have two, two options okay, for this case. Chemotherapy, which is you target rapidly dividing cells within the body. And you have immunotherapy, which is inhibition of immune checkpoints. So we have this immune reactions. So immune therapy will, uh, will uh, so our normally will stop this uh, immune reactions in our nature, in, in our body, but then we'll do therapy to inhib inhibit those checkpoints, right? So the test is called tumor mutation burden, and it just measures how many, uh, measures the quantity of mutation found in tumor, basically how many mutations you have uh, in, in your tumor cells, right? So an idea is that if you have more mutations in your tumor cells, you are more likely to make random new, anti, new antigen load, right? Random proteins get in frame set mutation or termination, and you make some epitope expressing it. And with, that will cause your immune cells to react more. That's increased T cell reactivity. And that will enhance anti-tumor anti immune response, right? So if you have more uh, tumor mutation burden, more mutations, then you, you will be more helpful to use immunotherapy because you don't want to, you want innovation of immune ch checkpoint. You don't want to use chemotherapy where you have your, all you, you have to target all the dividing cells. Right? In this case, immunotherapy will be a good one. So for example, you can see here, if you have like a lot of blood cancers, then those mutations are not found a lot. But in lung cancers, you see that there are a lot of mutations uh, that high TMB score, you can say, these mutations. So the patient comes in, uh, depending on which cancer, you measure this TMB, and you say, okay, the patient falls, like blood cancer, it's here. There's no use of, uh, TMB is low, there's no use of uh, using immuno uh, over here. But if the same, even if it's the same case, if it comes with lung cancer, but if someone lies here, they don't have that immune thing going on, right? But if somebody lies here, the TMB score, then yes, definitely this is a good candidate for uh, immunotherapy and versus chemotherapy. Right? So yeah, this is bioinformatics. You have these all the complex processes. 
but basically uh, this one is a really complex one where you have you target about 5000 genes and you have like the uh, hybridization technique where your actual targets are more than 25000 with 1000 are in disease associated and there are a lot of clinical databases and these genes and targets cover almost 99% of I think uh, uh, targets so so this is how it's a simple example where computer science you know generate an organized results and you use statistics you check like likely put of survival and then you have this uh, biology from where you can think about treatment options. So how th these three different parts are interconnected and work together in bioinformatics. So now briefly about uh, bioinformatics opportunities in Nepal. So we and uh, a couple of about five people of we are thinking uh, some, some feasibility study about, uh, is there a, a possibility for us to establish a next gen uh, diagnostic and research institute, some, some type of this? And basic idea is we just focus on NGS diagnostics because as we were saying that now this, this is not that hard to set up if we have like if we have a good team and start working to it okay, technically wise also in five or ten years and things are going to get cheaper and it's going to be uh, not that far off for us and if we have this setup setting then we uh, we have also seen these issues where a lot of people who are interested in doing research in nepal they're finding they're coming up with this problem like one case we had that that they were not able to find storage just minus 80 that's working properly or some bureaucracy issues where they were not able to collect samples right so the idea of lab space rental services on also mobile lab services research teaching collaborations and biomedical consultation and basically idea here is to focus uh, the research part and technique uh, teaching part i think that that will be uh, integral part and no matter what either we do or somebody that will be keep keep on going and no one can stop it just the way how things are progressing but with diagnostics part uh, here we can take this some model like where we don't compete with current diagnostic labs because uh, it's, it's there are already many and there are these are the highly top 10 populated areas cities in nepal so we, we, what we try to do is that we try to take this full model and synergistic partnership. We partnership with them. And if they need NGS services, we do a pooling. So we pull all this testing. If they want to do cancer, cancer testing for something panel, then we pull this in together and we run it. And then if, they, if we want some kind of other uh, testing, if the patient comes to us, then we can collaborate with them. So, so the team uh, we are discussing it looks like and this is something that uh, we want to uh, discuss further with expertise uh, in the areas and also uh, another areas is very veterinary diagnostic can we expand this to plant agriculture especially in chitwanding hub right so uh, are there any opportunities for that and what's government regulation usually over here if you do um, a patient like human then it's almost impossible for you to also do mouse and other diagnostics in there so uh, how is this regulation uh, in Nepal so that's also something to part study and I'm looking forward to uh, learn from and or going further policy meetings and other meetings to discuss these areas and see possibility down to about five to seven years if there's something that we can do in the field of bioinformatics in Nepal Thank you. Thank you, Cecil, for the wonderful talk on uh, how we can uh, utilize bioinformatics in medicine, as well as how we can collaborate uh, utilizing bioinformatics for medicine in Nepal. And with that, now I'd like to move ahead with the question answer section that has been uh, typed on the chats and I want to especially thank uh, Dr. Ananta Achari and Dr. Saras Parajuli who have been uh, giving answers to a lot of uh, the questions over there. Now I'm gonna read some of the questions that have been coming and I will uh, give a chance to all the speakers to respond to them. The first question that is uh, not answered here is uh, directed towards Dr. Lamichani. So it's from Dr. Hafiz Isfak. Ahmad, uh, the question is, could you please tell us some useful databases to study evolution and adapted evolutionary analysis in animal species? Yes, I think uh, some of them were covered in my talk as well as Dr. Radhika's talk. So there are a lot of databases depending on what you want to do. If you are interested in um, 
downloading the genomic data or any any downstream data like SNP data or any some kind of functional functional data. So there are a lot of data. I mean, uh, I can go on and on. So I don't want to talk about every right now. But yeah, it's just one googling away. Like you will see a lot of data, and then if somebody is interested, we can talk more in person about a specific database and need if, if somebody has it. Uh, thank you for the response. Uh, another question is from Amrit Sarma. Are there any alternative theories of evolution besides that of Darwin accepted by the scientific community at present? By minority, maybe. Uh, well, there are always these talks. And again, uh, this there is no like, and I think the answer to this can be more philosophical than scientific. So I don't want to go too much into that. But what we know at this point is uh, before this uh, genomic things came up, like of course there were so many other alternative hypotheses. Uh, but now with this uh, uh, genomic uh, evidence, I think we have pretty solid evidence of Darwin's uh, theory of evolution. So, well, uh, there might be some other supplementary theory that can complement uh, uh, theory of evolution. But apart from that, I don't think there are any other alternative theory that can be uh, confirmed by by genomic evidence. Thank you. Uh, the other question is from uh, Shubha Ratna Sakya. What are the 18 species of Darwin's finches? Are these finches limited to Galapagos Island only? Yes, I think that's a good question. Uh, we, we who are working with the finches, one of the most controversial thing that people sometimes highly talk about is uh, how many species there are. Uh, because as I said in my talk, they look, these all birds look very similar. So apart from the beaks, they are very very similar so, so and, and you know it's not that uh, every bird has this is not a binary trait there is a, it's a there's a lot of quantitative variations so there are possibilities where one species of bird might look very similar to the other bird unless we start looking at the genome so there has been a lot of discussion in the past about how many species there are when i started my project uh, the previous publications would say there were about uh, 14 species but then once we started sequencing their genomes, like we started getting more and more and more evidence where we had to split some of the species into, into more. But yeah, so 18 species is the currently established uh, number based on our work. But who knows, like uh, in one of my recent publication, like I have, we have shown like how two species can continuously hybridize and then they can just can uh, cross the species boundary and they can become one species. So these things are very dynamic. So the number can change uh, in the future. And, and the next question, it's a good question, like uh, almost all the species are in Galapagos, but there is one additional uh, island, uh, which is not in Galapagos, but it is somewhat away from, from Galapagos. And uh, they have their own uh, local species of uh, Darwin's finches uh, uh, in that island. And what our analysis had, has shown that perhaps at some point, and the, the ancestors of that uh, species flew over from Galapagos. So the ancestors were from Galapagos, but then they somehow managed to colonize in, the, in, in, a, in a different island. So 17 out of 18 are in Galapagos, and one is in a different island uh, called Caucasus Island. It's uh, close to Cuba. Mm, excellent. And the uh, final question for you is from Dr. Naresh Kumar Sa. What about uh, genomic studies on domesticated animals or domesticated breeds of animals? Yeah, again, I, I didn't touch on that. Uh, I, I slightly touched on that on one slide where I talked about uh, animal breeding approaches. Like we, you know, we, have, we can use these genomic methods to, uh, to use uh, uh, advanced genomic selection methods to, that can aid on uh, genomic selection, uh, on uh, animal breeding. But yes, I mean, the, the core thing that we want to know is like, we want to know what is a specific phenotype we are looking for it could be reproductive trait it could be any trait and the underlying method is, is still going to be the same so if so, there are many groups who are working with like uh, what are the genes that can control specific reproductive trait how can we enhance the reproductive ability of, uh, of a particular uh, domestic animal and then indeed like there are a lot of a uh, lot of work and again that can be a topic of a different uh, present, uh, session or a different uh, seminar but yes there are many, many other resources being done in the, in the domestic animal as well. But the core thing, the, the core thing that we discussed today, the methods are going to be the same. The genomic underlying genomic bioinformatic methods are very similar. Yep, uh, excellent. Certainly, uh, thank you for your uh, response to the questions. Uh, I now 
like to move ahead with other questions to Dr. Radhika Bartola. So it's from Jiwan Pandey. Uh, the variation coming from traditional breeding narrows the genetic base. Despite narrowing, breeders continue to make progress. What strategies will reverse this trend? Um, thanks, Jiwan, for the excellent question. Yes, indeed, um, the conventional breeding um, have um, created a lot of genetic um, bottleneck. Um, for example, in case we can just look at the that or look at the um, Borlaug dwarf um, plants that resulted in green revolution, he just selected um, except the yield he selected for the dwarf plants. And while doing that, um, so he fixed the, uh, the 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 genes for dwarf plant, but he lost many important traits such as related to um, root length, which was very important um, to draw nutrients. And because of that reason, um, it, we had to use excessive fertilizer and um, irrigation, and that resulted in negative um, impact. So yes, indeed, um, the, the um, conventional breeding, as was done in past, did the um, genetic bottleneck. So, and I think what breeders at this point have realized that uh, fixing one sort certain genes may be um, successful, but uh, it's through the integration from all those um, um, wild plants and bringing all other genes into a crop is actually going to be beneficial in the long run. And I think that's how um, modern breeders are approaching um, this um, conventional breeding. Yeah, perfect. Uh, there's one more question from uh, Jivan Pandey again. Uh, it's, why haven't all these QTLs been integrated into breeding programs for the respective crops that they have been conducted in? Um, excellent question again. Um, I think one of the biggest um, problem with QTL mapping, and as you will see, you will find hundreds and hundreds of um, papers that have identified QTL and there's nothing done after that. And one of the reason is most of the QTL reasons are very large. And once they identify, they don't know what to do with that. That's why they have never been um, validated or being narrowed down. But with, I think, the uh, um, advent in this next generation techniques where we can generate thousands and thousands of molecular markers uh, and with a fine mapping, we can narrow the, uh, the genetic regions of those QTL. And also with this genomics, uh, we, we can find the real genes that are associated with the traits. And I think um, they can be, with this modern trend, a lot of the QTL have been actually uh, applied for the crop improvement. Great, uh, thank you for that response. Uh, another question is for Dr. Lamichane. It's from Dr. Hafiz Ishfaq Ahmad. Is there any role of bioinformatics in reproduction of animals or to improve reproductive, reproductive efficiency in animals? I think it was similar question as the one before. So I think I, I just had the same answer to yep. that. Perfect, thanks. And uh, there's a lot of discussion going on about GMOs in the chat. Uh, it was really interesting. And there are a few questions. Uh, I mean, this will go out to either uh, Dr. Bartola or Dr. Parazili or uh, Dr. Atsari, whoever can answer. So the first question is from uh, Dinesh Khanal. What is the main issue behind the non-acceptance of GMO as a healthy food? So uh, I, I think I can um, summarize all these GMOs and the generating uh, in a single answer is uh, it's, it's a lot of, uh, so science versus politics versus other or different things going on there, right? So um, uh, we, we do not, so scientifically, a lot of the GMOs have been proven uh, they are safe. But the, the, it, it, what it comes sometimes, okay, so it is proven for like 10 years, but what about what have would happen 20 years, 40 years or so? Maybe we don't know to the end, that answer. Uh, but again, looking at some of the uh, you know, trans, trans uh, omics analysis I was talking about in the earlier, right now we do a lot of analysis uh, looking at the proteins and the metabolites and what are the effects on those ones. So, Scientifically, I think it is uh, uh, like everybody agrees that GMOs are safe, but there are these political reason or how um, uh, different countries and different regulation structures came out. It will make different discussions. And 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 uh, one thing is we can always 
we can start discussing and science and we can discuss but there wouldn't be in a forum of like 100 people we cannot agree on uh, the you know, political agendas uh, same with the generating the generating is uh, some people say generating because we are not using any, any dna from foreign uh, especially like like in, in the case of the bt or or in, in some herbicide tolerance we are not using the bacteria gene we are just editing the gene so can this be the um, uh, can we consider it as a non gmo us says maybe yes eu says no so this is again uh, what how do we define those things and actually gmo is genetically modified and and if if you uh, looked into like all the evolution talk or, or, or crop science uh, in, in the Dr. Bartola's talk, what the um, carrot was or what how maize, uh, maize came from Tiosante versus how carrot came from that, that's all the genetic modifications, right? So even the conventional breedings make those genetic modifications, but the term GMOs have been used uh, indifferently. So I, th I think this is a huge discussion uh, that probably we cannot solve is today. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you for uh, summing up the response on all the GMOs. I think it's a really fluid topic and uh, many people have their own opinions, but uh, we always focus on the science part of it. And now I'd like to move on to the application of bioinformatics into medicine. And there's a question for uh, Cecil Subedi. The question is from uh, Suman Dungel. Uh, would you please tell me more about TMB score? Okay. Are you hearing me? Yes. Oh, okay. So TMB is basically it's tumor mutation burden. And what we are measuring is, so when you have take this tumor cell, then how exactly how many numbers of mutations are there for MB? Let's say. So that's the that's the main uh, thing is uh, just to straight up number by megabase and total mutations. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for the answer. And uh, I think in general for uh, plant breeders, there's a, another question from Resam Babu Amgai. So the question is, sequence of each genotype is very different with each another. How can the genome sequence of a genotype from other countries like America or Europe, which is not accessible to Nepalese breeders or farmers, how can they benefit to Nepalese people? Is it only for knowing that those genotype has this type of brilliant sequence? Uh, okay, I'll take that on. Take that on. So I think there are two things again, uh, and and uh, uh, as Radhika Bortola, like Bortola said, uh, we have this QTL mapping and different association mapping. Most of the time, although they uh, are probably different in the whole genome level, but for a for a specific gene level, for a specific disease response to a disease or some traits, that might be a same gene coding the uh, same gene coding for that. So, so if for something, we, we, if we know the QTL or the, if we know the sequence, if you know some sequence of, let's say UES that is resistant to, let's say rice blast, and we sequence a lot of genomes from Nepal, and then we see the same sequence, maybe we can say, oh, okay, seems like these genomes are probably resistant for that genome. I think this is that, that knowledge, uh, that uh, knowledge of, you know, how we can uh, apply any QTLs or the SS mapping. The other thing is the diversity. Like I think, I think uh, I, uh, we were talking about earlier that narrowing, narrowing, nar we are narrowing down the gen genomic diversity. But knowing the the total genomic diversity for the whole crop, maybe that is that is one of the thing plant breeders always do. And I, I know you probably will is do, will do it, is you always bring some outside variety to gain and to increase the population base. And maybe if we, look, if we look at the sequence, then we can say, oh, okay, so this sequence is very different from all the uh, different varieties we already have, so let's introduce this one. So I think, you know, uh, these two are probably main uh, reasons. Yeah, um, that's an... Also yeah, one thing ahead. I want to add um, to, to Dr. Um, um, at its point. So also the other thing that we can do as uh, shown by Dr. Lamy Sani with the birds. So, um, you know, a lot of traits are fixed within the Nepal. For example, if we just look, 
maybe that there is no variation within the genome if we just look into the, the land races of rice because for some reason, say, you know, uh, the high altitude ones are fixed for that. And unless we compare with the outside genes, we are not going to find out those um, sequences, those variants that we did not even see in our DNA actually is um, responsible for um, traits that are adapted to Nepal. And I think even if we do not get any of the, the, the physical seeds or plants from those European varieties, those genome sequence from the European varieties would still be useful to understand uh, what are the genetic basis uh, for, for uh, selection for the Nepalese um, crops. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Bartolo and Dr. Acharya for those answers. Uh, I want to add one more thing to this question because this seems uh, very relevant. Uh, if you are a breeder in Nepal and know that there are certain varieties that are in the United States that have the traits that you want to integrate into your breeding program, then United States has a, an organization called USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, that has a germplasm resource network called Green Database. You can go to the Green Database and you know, you can ask for seeds if you want to do research on those seeds. So they can, they are freely available to all researchers all over the world. So you just need to make sure that, you know, importing in your country, that is legal and you have papers for that. But other than that, you can get those seeds freely. So if you know that there is a certain threat in some of the varieties uh, from the United States, then you can uh, request to get those seeds freely. But uh, moving on to the next question from Prabhes Koirala. Is there any relation or similarities between pan-genesis theory and Mendel's theory? I think this is for me. Uh, yes, you know, as I was saying before, like in our pre-genomic era or, or in our earlier days, evolution was just about theories. Like people had their own theories and uh, it was easy to make theories because there was no uh, need for hardcore evidence because we didn't have methods and the tools available and this pangenesis theory is just one of them which is which has been already considered absolute after uh, the start of this century because once we had uh, the core molecular data i mean most of this theory were just gone because they were just theory that was not proven by any biological findings but then as i would just want to continue what uh, dr Acharya said in his talk as well is that with the genomes these days basically we don't need any theories or hypotheses right i mean we are free to use genomes for making our own hypothesis so these days what we do is we don't actually work with any theories or hypotheses we start with the genomes and then see what we find so again this is all hypothesis free and theory or like any expectation free research what is all genomics is all about so yeah i mean uh, so I, I don't think this is the right time where we can discuss about theories because now we, we should all start with the genomes or looking at actually it's what's happening inside the inside the dna and then comes up with the theory later yeah yeah exactly we have a lot of uh, data that we can use to test uh, a lot of hypotheses these days and other question again directed to you is what is the possibility of research conduction evolution in kusitapu which is rich in biodiversity with nearly more than 900 species found there Absolutely. And I remember in one of my slides where I talked about biodiversity hotspot, and then I said Himalaya is one hotspot. But when we, when, when the data is taken, the Himalaya is not just the mountains, but I think the entire Nepal is considered as a central Himalaya. So definitely, like it's not just Kosi Tapu, but our entire country, the, the central Himalaya is very, very rich in biodiversity and is one of the top most biodiversity hotspot in the, in the world. And absolutely, I mean, as I was saying in my talk, uh, there is a lot of potential there. We have a lot of amazing biodiversity, uh, but again, nobody has done any work there. Uh, it's all because of lack of expertise, lack of resources. So yeah, I mean, definitely we have very true potential to study not just Kochi but you know, the, the overall biodiversity across the entire country. I think that's what uh, this uh, uh, webinar is all about like how we can uh, take uh, collaborations and uh, resources to nepal to study these, these these stuffs yep yeah perfect thank you and there other question is from anus lamichane uh, where can we access the genome sequence data on plants and animals from nepal i'll go ahead and answer that so for this you can easily go to ncbi website and if you search for nepal you will uh, certainly find a lot of sequences that are available there a lot of uh, dna sequences are put in SRA database. If you 
go ahead and just search it on the NCBI website. You should be able to download those data. And in the uh, next uh, couple of days, we will be showing you other, uh, other places where you can access to data and how you can download them as well. Uh, next question is from Manumaya Magar. When you are working at whole genome level, is it necessary to refer to genome of all the varieties of same crop to be considered, or is there any specific variety that can be taken as a complete pool for that crop? Okay, um, I think I'll take that one. Uh, it's almost impossible to consider all the varieties. Uh, so we, we, we do not even have the genome sequences for uh, everything. So that will never be available. But when we talk about the reference genome, so and, and that is again goes back to the uh, our evol revolution in the genomic. Uh, in 2003, we had one human genome. Right now, probably there are thousands of thousands of human genome sequence. And even as a reference genome, in we used to have just one corn. And right now, we, we generate, like every company generate their own different uh, heterotic groups on different different maze lines or wood lines. So it is always best to find the nearest uh, variety from what you are working on. So there are like, uh, before whole genome, maybe you can use the SSRs or some other SNPs or some other ways or now what we generally call GBS to kind of look at the uh, relationship between different varieties and then to map that and based on that uh, that you know gbs data and the relation between the varieties then you can use whatever is closest for that given variety so for example in nepal they say that that is something that probably uh, dr powder and Paraj will talk about tomorrow on rice we have multiple genomes so for uh, looking at nepalese rice is japonica variety better japonica reference better or indica probably indica is better right those kind of things i think we'll uh, we'll discuss that tomorrow thank you dr Atari, for the response the other question is uh, agricultural research and technological innovation takes very long time to reach uh, up to farmers in field and adaptation in a developing country like nepal what might be the causes and solutions this is coming from saurabh sarma great question and 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 i think uh, it's it's not only I would say not only in Nepal or not only in uh, it, it's it's same in a lot of countries uh, even in US uh, I think this is sort of the vaccine development and if you look at the variety development process here it takes 13 14 15 years uh, for a for a variety development so that is also true in most of the countries because of the regulations or because of the need. But we, with some some advances, maybe we'll come down to five, six, or seven years. But it also takes a lot of things on the policy and the government level. And uh, and one thing I'm really uh, you know optimistic is all the researchers in Nepal and trying to utilize this one and a lot of the early adapter farmers. So I think if we can come up with some strategy, I don't think we'll have you know. I don't think farmers will say no. Farmers are so adaptive and, and there are so many of all farmers there, are all adapters. And if we can come up with some strategy, I'm pretty sure we can do that. And and, and again, it's it takes the private, public, in, universities, all of our collaborations and how to do that. Perfect. And uh, we move on to the uh, final question for uh, today. We are running much later than our schedule, but we'll, we'll take the final question. It is from Pankaj Yadav. How the specification in crop production narrow down the genomics or biodiversity of nature? Uh, well, I can take that. So again, um, so uh, with the specification, we are always trying to fix one genes. And when we are trying to fix one genes, we lose lots of other genes because, you know, um, from, from when you domesticate wild crops into modern crops, so there's something called a linkage drag that comes with, uh, with, with the gene. So what you want to do is you want to throw all other genes which might have useful characteristics, but because we want to fix one particular gene, so we only select for those genes of interest and that's how we actually lose the um, genomic diversity that was present in our um, wild ancestors or in, in uh, our uh, wild varieties. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bartola, for that answer. I think uh, we have answered most of the questions that were uh, in the chat box. And I want to, again, thank all of the speakers for their wonderful talk and all the participants today. Now I'd like to uh, 
ask Dr. Ananta Acharya to close this uh, seminar for today. Thank you, Dr. Porden. Uh, it, it was very exciting today. It is very, uh, we, we are thrilled to see the response. So uh, we had uh, more than 400 registrations. We had at a time, I think more than 210 uh, participants in Zoom. I think more than 60 uh, viewers in Facebook Live. Uh, and so, so many questions and the participation. And I, it went uh, almost one hour above our scheduled time. And we still see so many participants. So we are really thrilled. And, and uh, again, thank you to AFU, thank you to Napa. And we hope, and, and you see from all these different speakers and uh, our keynote speakers, we, are, we really want to collaborate. So let's think about those collaborations. And I, I hope we'll see you tomorrow where we'll discuss a lot of this, we'll have more questions, more time for questions, and we'll go more on details on uh, the evolution of this coronavirus and also the rice diversity. And then three days after that, we'll have some demo or hands-on experiments on, okay, where do we get all these genomic sequences? So in Nepal, if we don't have these sequences, what can we do? Can we start some biomedics career, career without even uh, any lab in Nepal uh, or, now, like we, you have seen from each of the speakers that we can collaborate to establish a facility. So what do we do there? So we'll have those responses. So come back tomorrow, uh, come back next three days. And again, I would like to thank you. I'll thank all the speakers today and all the participants today. And uh, let's end the session. Thank you very much.